Jamie Lee looks into the camera and she's got this list and she's like, okay, you ready? And they go, yeah. And they go, roll camera. And she's like, okay. And they go, action. And she goes, fuck you, Bob. I'm not doing this shit. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls from across the universe, there's a person in the box between below Christian and I. Who is this person? Gary J. Tunnicliffe. How are you doing, my friend? Welcome. I'm good. Good. Great. Great to be here. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, absolute pleasure. Yeah. Well, it is. Believe me, Christian and I are over the moon to have you here. Uh, we've been texting all week. He said he's very excited to ask you some stuff. I have been going through your YouTube ouvoir, as it were, uh, with Mr. H and Midnight's Edge and listening to oh, yeah, all right. these interviews you've given. And my God, the thing that struck me is this guy tells it like it is. Even if he's worked on something that he doesn't like, he will literally tell you, yeah, I worked on it. It sucked but I worked on it. Uh, I appreciate the authenticity. Oh, I've got even worse of late. Uh, I think since I kind of semi-retired, I have no fear of burning any bridges at all. So now I'm just, I'm ruthless. Absolutely ruthless. <laughs> semi-retired? Uh, what do you mean? I, I, did a, uh, I did a convention in Virginia last weekend and literally walked off stage and people were like, you know, that was live cast, right? I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't give a shit. You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, because uh, life's too short, and so am I. So, uh, you know, what's the point, you know? And um, uh, I was just thinking, actually, it's kind of cool, because, you know, you need a night of living dead, return of living dead. Uh, you know, technically, I worked with three members of that cast. I worked with Clue, I worked with Jimmy Caron, and I worked with Brian Peck. So, uh, you know, um, you know, it's always, it's always funny to think of uh, working my way through the cast. And actually just uh, met Miguel Nunez this weekend. He was uh, doing signing, so I met him. No well. kidding. It's Christian's favorite horror movie, Return of the Living Dead. So it's that's why, where the name comes absolute, from. Absolute th classic, you know what I mean? How can you not love that movie? It's, I know. it's, it's, it's hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. We just lost Clue the other day. He passed away. And Clue was, Clue was the curmudgeonless bastard you could ever work for. He was hilarious. He was oh, so man. much fun. Uh, he, again, he was a straight shooter. He just didn't care. And um, uh, he was great on Feast, and, and he loved John, his son. He really did. He was the biggest cheerleader for John mm. on everything. But he was, and, and, and I was going really well with him, but he was a miserable git. He, he could be just like, I don't oh, give man. a shit. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I love I Tapeheads, a film called Tapeheads with John Cusack and Tim Robbins, which he's in. So mm. I would always quote lines from that, and he'd, uh, he'd always chuckle and laugh about that, you know, so... Uh, yeah, Clue, uh, bless him, he was a really, um, but I think he had a great life, you know, I think he kind of, he did it to the max, and uh, and same with Jimmy Caron, Jimmy Caron was a, a real gent, you know, and um, I loved Jimmy dearly, I got to direct him in a, a, a film, and uh, yeah, he was great as well, he didn't have such a fond affinity for uh, Return of the Living Dead as some of the other people I've worked with, I think he was just like, it was just a, a movie he didn't, he could never understand why right. it was so popular, you know, but uh, that's the great thing about the horror genre, honor is it just uh you know um this is why i would say there aren't romantic comedy conventions there aren't action movie conventions there aren't you know uh, you know there are only horror movie conventions because yeah. horror movie fans are uh you know a breed unto their own <laughs> we're crazy we're, we're a wild bunch we are um guys uh if you aren't familiar with gary's work his career has spanned a lot of classic films Candyman, my favorite horror film of the 90s um Hellraiser, I think the first four movies, and I mean, I love that franchise, and, and Christian knows that. You guys know I've been on Hellraiser kick lately uh, with the new movie, and I love the first four films in that series. Uh, and uh, Christian and I, I guess we'll just we'll start right here. Um, this might be a weird place to start. You're gonna be like, "Well, most people ask me about Hellraiser first. Christian and I are dying to know about Halloween Resurrection. Enlighten us. What did you do on? Re it says you were in the movie. I am in it. I am in yeah, it. Yeah, which I, uh, Okay. Hold on, hold, hold on a second. Let me repeat okay. that. I am in it. Yes, I am in it. Uh, my voice went a bit high then, didn't it? Uh, I'm the paramedic who gets uh, who gets choked at the beginning of the movie and uh, I knew it. And You're then gets kidding me. Off. 
Yeah, the they, I'm wearing the most Michael crushes his face. larynx. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I am that man. You're uh, kidding me. And and I'm wearing a ridiculous mustache. And the story I can tell about <laughs> that is uh, that's the joy of being an effects guy. Sometimes is because it was kind of like a a, a kind of a little tiny role, but right. it needed a fake head. Um, so sometimes it's that's handy being an effects guy because the director will be like, uh, you can play that role, right? Well, you know, that way you can make the head, you'll be there and you can do this quick scene. And, uh, you know, it doesn't require too much acting, you know. But I mean, Rick was like, oh, but I know you can act. I've seen you act before. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the great thing about that shooting that scene was I think we shot it on my birthday. I think it was like the day <laughs> of my birthday. And what was really fun was that um, I think Jamie Lee turned up that day. So as I'm doing my scene uh, and getting choked by Brad and smashed against the wall, and when we did it, I just said to Brad, look, you grab hold of my neck, and then I'm just going to throw myself against the wall. So, you know, I'll you just hang on for dear life and look like you're hurting me, and I'm going to smash into the wall and try and mm. – there's a picture on the wall. So I'm going to try and smash the picture on the wall. Uh, so I was really going for it, and um, we finished the scene, and Rick's like, great job, fantastic, you know, go and put your makeup effects designer back hat on back on and as i'm walking off set jamie lee just turned up and she uh she walked up to rick and i heard her say she said wow that guy was he was really good that that guy he was really into it you know and what a good ah. performance and that was amazing i was like oh that's so cool J you know jamie just said Got that jamie lee rub. Ten minutes later, yeah <laughs> ten minutes later i walk into the into the trailer and i'm like hey jamie lee i'm gary the makeup effects designer and she's like what weren't you just the dude getting <laughs> getting his ass kicked you know, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a bit weird but um yeah so i did all i did all the kills on that film basically i didn't do the mask uh which was a bone of contention with mustafa ricard um but uh i did all of the kind of kills and the rats and i did the mask at the very end the melted mask but um no i remember uh, when we f i first got the gig i said you know hey am i doing the mask and they were like no 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 you're not doing the mask you know, I think Cinema Secrets or someone were doing it. I was like, okay. And they're like, so I'd, like I'd love to do the mask. And they're like, no, no, no. It's all taken care of. I was like, okay. So then I get to Vancouver where we're shooting the movie. Uh -huh. And I'm called into a meeting. And they've got Brad in the mask. And it was way too tight on him. And it was too small. And the eye holes were really, you could really see his eyes, which I always thought was really weird. And then Mustafa walks in. He's like, so this is too small. This is too big. This is too long. The hair's wrong. And I'm like, yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree completely. And he's like, so you need to fix it. And I'm like, I don't need to fix it. I didn't fucking make it. You know, <laughs> you, you did. I wanted to make it. And had we done it, it wouldn't have looked like that. But I didn't make it. So <laughs> they jog on, you know what I mean? I was like, sorry, Mustafa. And they were like, well, you have to help. And I was like, I don't really have to do anything. But I ended up trimming the neck and doing what I could. But I was like, his head's too big for the mask, you know. It's like, sorry, you know. It's Gary, like, Gary, um, let me ask you a question real quick, if you don't yeah. mind. You you talk about this mask. Now we read about this stuff all the time, and this wasn't the first time this mask gets screwed up like that. Now, as as a gentleman like you, you're you just seem like a kind the kind of guy that gets it right the first time. You know what I mean? How does this shit happen? Why do they? How does this stuff get screwed up like this all the time? They had a they had a pink mask in Halloween Four, a pink mask. What the hell's going on? Weird, right? It is weird. And it's weird that for some reason the first film still looks the best, you know, it still looks yeah. the very best. The first one in the first film, which was, you know, knocked together in a few minutes and was floppy latex. Sometimes I think they're overbuilt, these masks, you know, they're kind of like everyone's trying to, you know, make them, they're too thick and too hard. Whereas they're kind of, the first one was really kind of flimsy and loosey goosey. Um, it's the same as the Texas Chainsaw mask. It's like, you know, that, that first mask just seems perfect. And yet right. everyone ever since seems to be over designed or over sculpted and, I think all makeup effects artists are guilty of it to some degree. I think we over overthink it when uh, sometimes it's the rawness of it that makes it so so work so well. Um, but I think what happened on um, the situation with uh, Resurrection was Brad, who you know was cast to play the role, is a lovely, lovely guy. Has got a pretty big noggin. He's got a pretty large head. Uh -huh. uh, I don't mean he's arrogant. I mean he has a pretty <laughs> large head. Um, so, uh, latex shrinks, you know, so, I mean, um, anyone who's ever built a latex mask, you know, sculpted it on a bust of their head and then cast it and then put it on and been strangled by it, you know, realizes that latex shrinks pretty badly. So, um, yeah, I think that's what happened on that situation. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I like to think we got it right. I mean, I'm working for Vincent Van Dyke right now and they do the masks for, you know, with, um, 
and Christopher Nelson for the for the the new films, and they seem to look really great. They seem to have nailed it pretty well. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think it's uh, it's one of those things that sometimes the the simplicity of it. I think, like I say, I think makeup effects artists tend to want to really nail the details and uh, whereas when a production designer goes down the road and grabs a mask off a shelf and sprays it white and you know burns the hair off it or pulls the hair off it you you get something that's very very visceral and uh, instantaneous you know it's, mm. it's, and it, it's it happens a lot with a lot of effects that's a good segue because christian i didn't even know this until today when i was listening to one of gary's interviews on mr h's channel and and uh Gary was initially contacted and Gary, I'd like for you to explain more about this. Christian will find this very interesting because he was recently just going through the entire taking shape book about the entire Halloween franchise, which ended with 2018. Gary was initially contacted to be on for 2018 to do the makeup effects. And then Blumhouse, I guess they were yeah. like, well, we want to keep it in house with our guys or whatever. But Gary, what kind got- of bullshit is that Gary? Yeah. Keep it in house. What? Um, yeah, well, obviously, I had a relationship with Malik, uh, and still do. I mean, Malik's great, you know, Malik Akkad. I did a, a film called The Hatred for Malik, and um, and we'd also been down the road of trying to get a Halloween movie made with um, Dimension um, before the rights went to Blumhouse. So, I mean, uh, yeah, we were bouncing. And, uh, um, I mean, not only that, but there was also, previous to that, there was another iteration of the film which was going to be in 3D with um, Patrick Lussier and Todd Farmer's script. So we we got I think we were actually yeah we were we were in pre production on that and suddenly I got a call from Patrick saying stop stop everything don't do it we were so were you prepping court. were you prepping shit for that movie for Halloween three three D yeah absolutely wow. yeah we were in prep so that went bye bye then there was this other Halloween movie that was going to shoot in Serbia uh, uh, which is where they Halloween shot the returns. new movie Halloween um, returns yeah yeah something yeah uh, and then that went bye bye. So then when it came to the new uh, Halloween 2018, um, yeah, Malik was like, we're getting the team back together and Gary, you're going to be involved. And I got the script and I know Sean Gary, the line producer, uh-huh. and I did a breakdown. And then I was told, um, you know, Blumhouse want to use um, their guy, Chris Nelson, which is fine. I understand it. Yeah. So I think um, it was weird because it was like, yeah, I'm not doing it. It's all done and dusted. I'm out of the picture. And then I went to LA to do a project. And I was on the, I literally landed in Romania where I live. Uh, I live in LA and Romania. I bounced back and forth. Uh-huh. But I got home to Romania and Sean Gary, the producer, called me and said, Hey, can you get back on a plane and come back? We think we want you to do Halloween. And I was like, Really? And he's like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an issue with Chris Nelson. It's kind of not working out. We think we might want you to do it. And I was like, Seriously? And he's like, Well, give it a day. And a day later, they called back and said, No, no, it's all worked out with Chris. And uh, I guess, you know, and um, there you go, the proof of the puddings in the eating and you did a great job on the film. And, uh, as you know, like I say, now they've just you know, they've done all three. And um, I think Chris now is doing um, the new Exorcist movie with uh, with the same guys. So, yep. uh, yeah. So, yeah, very close, but um, close, but no cigar. So there you go. Gary, let me ask you this. Now, all you special effects makeup guys, do y'all are y'all all buddies? Do y'all in cahoots or is it like dog eat dog? It's like you've got to get the job, you know, because. Yeah, you say you're friends with these guys, but what's what's the truth here? I mean, you've got to get the job, right? No, it, it comes used down to, to it used to be it used to be really nasty, it used to be really hardcore. Everyone used to kind of um everyone used to pretend to be friends, you know, see each other, hey dude, what's up? You know, we're all hey man, I love you, and all that kind of shit. But then there'd be a lot of sniping behind everyone's back. Since since everyone's got a lot older and kind of ha- I think because everyone was at the beginning of their careers, like you know, the K and B's and the and the great can everyone was kind of fighting for work and there's a lot of secrecy so it was a lot more venomous but i think now that everyone's kind of got older and kind of like um has got some laurels they're all a bit more chilled out so it doesn't it's it's a it's i kind of miss it i said to someone the other day ah oh, it's a bit of a fucking love fest now isn't it like everyone's all hey man we're all friends and i was like i miss the days when we we're all like let's you know i mean and it was weird like B, for instance i always thought B were really my my biggest enemies right. um and the, and the funny thing is, is that, uh, you know, um, I'd always see Howard and Greg and Howard especially be like, hey, man, it's great to see you, you know, all this. But I had friends who worked in the shop over at KMB. So then uh-huh. they called me like, Howard was in here saying he just saw you and saying, you know, what a hack you are and how he hates you and all this. So it was always really funny that you'd hear, you'd see these people and then you had all of the guys who worked over at the shops because the, 
it tends to be the owners tend to be a bit more venomous towards each other, but then the crew, the shop crew, just switch out. I mean, uh, everybody works everywhere, really. You know what I mean? There's a there's a, a team of alias players that you always try and get, um, and they've always tended to settle into shops now. But um, yeah, it seems to have all mellowed out a little bit now, a bit too much. Everyone seems very friendly, and I uh, I miss the days of spiteful nastiness. You miss it. <laughs> I do, what? but uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot friendlier than it was. Gary, one more question about this. I really, because look, I, I'll never be in the movie business. I shouldn't say that. Maybe one day I'll get a lucky break somehow. But look, I'm talking to you right now. You've been there. You've done that. What's the best way, especially during that time? What will I guess what we'll call the heyday of like the horror, all that. Actually, I think we're in a good place now. But like back in that day, how do you make sure you get to the next job? What is the best way to get the best reputation with the producers? Is it, I'm assuming, is it time? Get how fast you can get it done? Is that like the biggest thing with like producers and stuff back in the day? Or or what 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 is it? What was the most producers, important thing? Oh, with that, I mean, uh, producers, I don't think, tend to see the quality of the work sometimes. So, I mean, they, they just want a number that works. So, I mean, uh, and if you look at my resume, you'll see that I worked for, I, I worked for some producers on 16, 18, 20 films. You know, so it was amazing to work with the same producers again and again and again. And I asked them, you know, I'd say, why'd you bring me back? And they're like, because you get it done, man. You get it done for the money you say. You know, and I used to have a bit of a motto when I used to meet new producers. I'd say, look, here's the deal. Two things about hiring me that I guarantee. One, if you hire me, I'll be the guy on set. I'm not going to send some guys to you. You know, like KMB used to get a lot of stick for that because... They tended to like Howard and Greg and Bob would do the, the show and be really cool. And producers would be like, this is great. And then when it came to shooting the movie, they'd send somebody else and they wouldn't see Howard or Greg or Bob. Um, uh, and I know there's a bit of dissension about that. But, you know, they were doing so many shows, can be, that it was impossible for them to do that. So it got prioritized based on budget and director. Um, with me, I tended to just do one show at a time. So if you hired me, you got me. And secondly, my other motto was what I say is what you'll pay. Even if it costs more money, I will, you know, I won't charge you anymore. I'm not going to get halfway through the film and go, oh, we've ran out of money, which some big effect shots did. I know that Greg Cannon ran out of money on uh, on a show literally halfway through and was like, we've run out. I think it was Benjamin Button. I think they actually ran out of money. And mm. uh, the studio had to send people in and say, what do you mean you ran out of money? And they were like, we've run out of money. We don't, you know, we can't finish the show. So, I mean, um, I think as that that was really my agenda or my kind of operandus, you know, for working and to keep producers was, um, uh, you know, say, uh, give them a number and stick to it and then turn up and do the job and get it done um, and be flexible. You know, I mean, I uh, I was always like, if they were like, can we get an extra so-and-so? You know, it's like, yeah, I can do that. Oh, can we get three more of those? Well, now you're going to have to pay. You know what I mean? Like, you know, there's a little bit of padding in there. But um, I think once you establish a rapport and you've got producers like Joel Swasson and uh, Ron Schmidt and people like that, they were always like, look, you know, you don't bullshit us. So, uh, and that's why they tried to get me on other shows uh, with other directors who used other effects teams. I mean, going back to KMB, I know KMB were not happy when I did Scream 4. They were, they were pretty pissed off, you know, like, I mean, I remember someone calling me and saying, you know, the guys just came in and said, you stole Scream 4 from them, but uh, I didn't steal it. They they fumbled the ball. So, you know, what yeah. can you do? You know, Wes, 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 was, Wes said to me, I'm I'm tired of the way things have been going and I've, I've heard good things about you. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm willing to make a change. And uh, we had a great time on that show. So, yeah, I think uh, I think the trick is, and even it still stands today, I think it's just a case of being, you know, doing the job you'll say, delivering the goods on time uh on set i think it's about um it's about time management you know if you say makeup you know I, I do a thing when i do a film or used to when i would as soon as i got a project uh i would write the eight, the assistant directors a list saying this makeup takes this long to apply this long to remove you know and uh, these are the kind of stipulations of doing it and I had so many ADs come to me and say, first of all, I've never had that from a director, from a, a makeup effects guy. And secondly, I've never had one who actually stuck to the times that you said, you know, like so often they'll say, oh, it's going to be two hours and it's four, you know, and, uh, you know, and I was yeah. like, no, I, I have great respect for the time, you know, that things need to be done on set. Mm -hmm. That's what helped me yeah. as a director as well, you know what I mean, with like time management. So um, those are the things I would say. And I'd, I'd say that for anyone getting into the industry now is 
just uh you know if, if if you do a project and you go up a budget you have to you have to bite that amount of money you have to suck it up you can't suddenly turn around halfway through and say oh we spent more money than we said we were gonna like you'll never get a job again you know no one's gonna want to hire you yeah yeah and and you know i i know that a lot of our listeners are going to want us to tackle this pretty heavily and and so this is Pretty much a good segue into that. Um, Gary, you got your, I don't know if it was your first big break or opportunity. I mean, it might have been. I, I believe you telling me, or not me, but I mean, I was listening to podcasts where Gary was telling the audience that his dream was to work with uh, Clive Barker on a Hellraiser movie and go to Los Angeles, California. And he achieved yeah. all three of those things with his first yeah entry into the franchise with hell on earth um yeah. talk about what that was like you know coming into hell on earth and obviously you said that clive did the reshoots for that movie so you got to be you know yeah. on in person with clive and work on that movie how was that oh it was a, that was amazing it was an incredible time i mean i was really young i was probably 22 so i mean i was a huge fan of hellraiser i mean that was one of the films that kind of i was a clive barker fan anyway you know, I'd sat in my local cinema watching Hellraiser, looking up a pinhead, saying, who did that? How did they do it? I want to do that. Um, and then I got to Image Animation, uh, which was ran by the brilliant Bob Keane, uh, and they just finished uh, Hellbound, I think, and Nightbreed. So I was coming on the tail end of that and kind of, you know, and there were Hellraiser boxes in the cabinets and, you know, and Cenobites and stuff like that. So I was just like a kid in a candy shop. And then we got the call that um, Hellraiser 3 was going to happen, written by Peter Atkins, going to be directed by Tony Randall. Um, and I was literally just like, a, I was one of the crew members. I was just going to be making the boxes primarily. So I started making the boxes and people were assigned their various tasks on the film. And we had a great crew, including Mark Coulier, who went on to become like a two-time Oscar winner and, you know, uh, a brilliant makeup artist. And I think... Uh, else was on it we had uh, dave dave elsey was on it and yeah great crew uh paul jones steve painter whole whole real cool but as the prep was going along um certain things were getting missed and kind of not happening right and i had a pretty good managerial experience so uh, i started to kind of get involved in other things on the show and making sure that things got done and uh happened on time and got sent out and uh, i didn't go out on the initial shoot to uh, North Carolina. So I was the backup guy sending stuff out and making sure everything was kind of like done. Uh, and then actually started prepping on Candyman. So um, we finished the initial shoot on Hellraiser, which obviously ended up with Tony Randall not directing it and Tony Hickox being brought in. Um, and I was kind of like always on the phone with the guys going, how's it going? Is it cool? Is it going to be amazing? Is it fantastic? Because mm -hmm. the script was really cool. And then... Um, Six or seven months later, I'd, es I'd escalated even further up in the company and was even had more uh, kind of like um, importance. And there was a reshoot scheduled for Hellraiser 3 when Dimension took it over. I think they wanted to amp up some of the killings and change some bits and pieces. And uh, suddenly it was like, um, you know, Bob and myself and Steve Painter going out to Los Angeles to do enhance various kills in the boiler room and do the skin girl. Um, mm -hmm. and Ali and that kind of stuff. And of course, so it's like, I'm going to go out and do that. So it's like, yeah, I get to get to Los Angeles and I'm going out to work on a Hellraiser movie. And I think on the second day we arrived, it was like, right, we're going out for dinner with, dinner with Clive Barker. And I was like, dinner with Clive Barker. Okay. This is try not to shit your pants, Gary, you know? And, uh, <laughs> I, I remember Clive walking up to me and going, hi, my name's Clive Barker. And I was like, yeah, I know. Yeah, you I know. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then kind of got directed by Clive on set in a very strange way. So uh, um, Clive kind of came down to set and visited and kind of hung out. And we were shooting, uh, it's been so long since I've seen Hellraiser 3, but there's a scene where um, Terry's being turned, going to be turned into a Cenobite and this kind of weird creaturey thing comes out the floorboards. Uh -huh. and, and I was I was puppeteering that. I'm underneath, it's, a, it's an elevated set and I'm underneath the set with a kind of tongue mechanism and this creature which is covered in slime and and underneath it and i'm sticking it through and i'm wearing sunglasses because there's there's a light between my legs and i'm wearing a trash bag because there's goo being poured all over the creature oh, and man. um and we do one take and uh i'm kind of moving this creature around i can't see anything i'm just moving this rod so the creature's kind of going rah, rah, you know? and uh, it goes quiet and it's like cut 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 and i hear clive go gary 
Gary. And I'm like, I stick my head out this hole and I look over the thing and there's Clive and he's like, Gary, it's, it's not really working right. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, you know, when you're jerking off and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And he's like, you know, when you're jerking, you're jerking, you're really jerking it, you're really jerking it, and you're just about to come, and you flick your dick around, and the cum's flying all out of it. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Completely quiet set, no one's really looking. It's like quite, you know, everyone's like, <laughs> he's like, yeah, you, you know that when you're just, you've come, and you're like, your cum spurts everywhere. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, that's how I want you to puppeteer it. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay. Gary's like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I can do that. Don't don't worry about Clive that. Clive Parker, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, exactly what you want, Clive. And and, and that's Gary, what I did, so that was that was, the, that was the direction I got from Clive Parker. So. It, it's interesting because you've you've talked about how as the years have gone on, and you're not so much fond of Hellraiser three because you feel like it it went away from what hellraiser and hellbound uh were really focusing on this world building with the cenobites and leviathan and the labyrinth and all that and made it more leaning into that 90s slasher type and that is true i mean that whole third act of hellraiser 3 love it or hate it people it it is very like let's be over the top and oh it's, a, it's it, a it's a very different film i mean the thing is is that if you if you you know to me what's really amazing about hellraiser one and two is um, is that they look like they were shot back to back almost. I mean, they feel the same. They've got the same right. tone. I mean, uh, it's it's amazing to me. They feel so. And even though they're supposed to be America, it always feels like England to me. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's just something about the just the look of it. And then Hellraiser three. Really, if you take if you were to go and watch um, Waxworks two, you know, or uh, Warlock of the Armageddon, which Tony directed right before those or after those, they they look very similar. They got a very similar feel to them. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, Tony's a very kind of rock and roll director, I think. And, um, yeah, made a very rock and roll film. Whereas I think <coughs> had Tony Randall made the film, I think you would have got something much more darker and a bit creepier. And, uh, yeah, <coughs> I don't know if it would have been the um, the kind of, I mean, everyone who said the MTV generation movie that we got with Hellraiser 3. So. Yeah, well, and I, well, I, I, feel that's where the, I feel that's where the wheels started to come off, which really, I suppose you could say it's when Dimension took over and, uh you know, um, the Weinsteins got involved because well, it, it, it suddenly changed the whole dynamic of everything. I happen to be a huge fan of Bloodline myself, and we'll touch on that in a second, but I wanted to ask you about the Black Mass scene from Hellraiser 3. Um, the controversial scene that, I mean, I had heard stories, and I want to know wh what you know of this. I heard crew members were like, I'm not doing this shit. They're like, the I'm Black not going to. Oh, you mean the uh, the older yeah, scene? The, yeah, the pe one? people have called it the Black Mass, you know, stuff like that. They've appropriated right. different names to it. But, like, I heard that that was a point of contention. Like, churches were like, you cannot shoot this in a church. And that some crew members were like, I will not be a part of this. Do you have <laughs> recollection of that? Honestly, until you mentioned it, I don't really remember anything about it. But I do remember Doug saying something like, um, you know, because it was kind of like in the South, there was definitely it raised some hackles, I think, you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think, uh, yeah, so that's all I really remember, again, since I wasn't there. And uh, so I'd hate to speak out of turn. Again, uh, I, you know, as you mentioned before, I like to tell the truth. So I don't want to, I don't want to tell a yeah. story that i don't really know so i mean uh but i do now that you mentioned it i was like oh yeah i do remember doug over the years saying that there was some uh there was some there was some weirdness about that whole thing at the time yeah the only thing i ever think was funny is that if you watch doug in that scene when he says i am the way um i think they blew the charges a little early and it really shocked him so uh you know <laughs> see him kind of go i am the way you know like you know <laughs> It's, that and no, he says like, stop a bubble. He is the it, scene where he says, "I am on stop a bubble." Yeah, I, it's it's my favorite scene in that film, and and it's, it's a great it, scene. And I am a I, I I'm a Christian. I always have been. I mean, you you wouldn't know it by how I live my life for the type of shit that I like, but I I am. And so, but it's always blasphemous to like that scene. But I don't give a shit. It's amazing. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess I I'll just the, I made the worm on the pin. Oh, you! Oh, that that thing Hell is so yeah, fucking brother. nasty. Yeah, yeah. The worm on the pin for the insert. Yeah. Hell yeah! Um, I want to talk to you about Bloodline. Um, Let me. Because, hey, can yeah. I ask one question real yeah. quick, Nick? About yeah. Hellraiser three. May, Gary, you may you may not be the person to ask about this, but literally, who the who else can I ask? You're the first guy involved with this movie. The thing about Hellraiser three is it gave me my love for the band Armored Saint. Oh right! Absolutely. I want to know 
I John Bush's voice is one of the greatest in that genre of thrash metal ever. Gary, how did Armored Saint get involved in Hellraiser three? I think he was know? one of the producers. Uh, like you know, again, it was one of those things at the time where again it was the MTV thing, same as the um, uh, uh, Motorhead doing the uh, the Ozzy Osbourne song Hellraiser for the end credits. Right. You know, what I mean? it was just there was a lot of I think um, Weinstein's had a lot of crossover into music and were kind of like. You know, a lot of that, hey, the kids will dig this. You know what I mean? So uh -huh. I think it was uh, I think it was one of those situations. And uh, I know that I do remember hearing that Armored Saint were very um, like bands agree to be in movies sometimes and don't realize it means they're going to be there all day. You know, and I think uh, they got pretty tired of the whole situation for what, what I remember hearing because I was a you know big metal fan. I still am. So I was like, oh, who's who's the band? You know, and they were like, Armored, the guys were saying, oh, some band called Armored Saints. And I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, and uh, but they were like, yeah, they were pretty miserable by the end of the day. And it was a long day, you know. But, um, yeah, I think it was just one of those times when it was like uh, uh, Dimension. One thing about Dimension is that same as casting, like even in Bloodline and uh, the films down the pipe, is that they um, they were always very kind of hip with what was going on. So um, I, I'm just assuming that somebody in uh, somebody had a, a connection with Armand Saint and got them involved. You know I, mean? I just think that's awesome. Yeah, that's really yeah. cool. And that uh, was right before – when it came to the Hellraiser video for um, for Motorhead, there's a, Motorhead agreed to do a video, but only on the premise. Lemmy said, "I'll do a video, but only if Clive Barker directs it." So Clive Barker directed the um, and it, that video. video is amazing because he's playing like blackjack or oh, poker God. with. I mean, it's fucking Lemmy. That's the god, man. Rest in peace. I fucking love Lemmy. Yeah, I and just, the, the only that, funny story I remember Doug saying is that uh, you know they they shot all day long, and uh, he's you know, and Doug said. That's real Jack Daniels that he's drinking. And he said, you know, Glenn literally drank like two bottles of Jack Daniels like, <laughs> and, shooting, and got up and walked out. You know what I mean? And was like, that's... you know, without a slur, you know. He didn't eat food. All he did was drink Jack. <laughs> that's all Lemmy. he did. The other story I heard about Lemmy once was from uh, from the producer of Hardware. And she said that when they flew him over to, uh, from L.A. to uh, England to shoot on Hardware for Richard Stanley, that uh, he drank the plane. They flew him over first class on Virgin, and he drank the plane dry of their supply of oh, whiskey. Yeah. And the hostesses couldn't believe that he was actually able to stand up and walk off the plane. They were like, he's just consumed so much whiskey. That's what he that's, that still that gets him when he walks up, you know? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so Hellraiser 3 has a very special place to me because it literally, that was, oh, me too. Me it too. birthed my love for Armored Saint. And like, how do you top that? I mean, I love the Hellraiser film so much, but they birthed my love for one of the greatest fucking bands ever. So I, mean, I other, love the other, the, other, the other great thing is that what was really amazing, not only did I, so I got to, I got to be in LA, you know, and like literally got to go to Universal Studios and kind of Disney and do all the stuff that I'd always dreamed about and work on a Hellraiser movie, doing a skinned person as well, which was really cool. Work with Clive Barker. And then at the same time, um, the girl who I did the skin makeup on was a, a girl called Jill Kershaw. And while we were doing the makeup, there used to be a radio station in LA called Pirate FM. And uh -huh. uh, and they were all week long, they were like saying that Michael Schenker would be playing at the Roxy. And I was, what? I am a huge, I'm a huge Michael Schenker fan. Always have been. I mean, look, you know, I have a flying V tattooed on my arm. Oh my God. Well, I love Michael Schenker. And I was like, and they're like playing it this Thursday at the Roxy, Michael Schenker unplugged. And I was like, that's the guy I love. And, the day after I did her makeup, she came to visit set and she walked up to me. And she went, I have a present for you. And it was a ticket to go and see Michael Schenker. And, uh, and my boss, Bob King, gave me the night off. And so while they were shooting, I went up to the Roxy and uh, went and watched Michael Schenker. So, I mean, uh, I remember calling my girlfriend at the time and going, I think I'm going to die. Like, I think I'm going to, the plane's going to crash on the way home because everything, <laughs> everything that I've ever wanted is going to happen. You know, like it's all happened. Michael Schenker, Dude, Clyde awesome. Barker, Hellraiser. LA, fuck, it's it's over, you know. So that's yeah, it was one of the most underrated guitarists ever. I love his work in UFO. Michael Shanker is one that's of the cool. most underrated. That's awesome. But Gary, I know Nick is a big Bloodline fan, and that's why I made Bloodline the background of our of our stream here. Nick, you've got oh, questions for Gary. We don't have enough time, Nick. We need to do another three hour segment. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm only gonna touch the tip of the iceberg the here. Movie, I, the movie that would not end. Oh my god. Yeah, and and I want to ask before I get you to elaborate on it. I I've heard Gary talk about that Kevin Yeager's like initial 
like the idea for this film, like they were excited about it. And, and, and Gary really thought there was a lot there. And then, you know, obviously reshoots and studio interference and then the whole Joe Chappelle coming in and eventually being Alan Smithy and, and all the shit that happened with bloodline being what it is. But correct me if I'm wrong from the beginning there, you really liked the approach they were going to take with bloodline and it all just kind of unraveled slowly and then became the shoot from hell that would never end. Uh, so initially, very weird, first of all, that I got called to work on it because Kevin Yeager was this kind of like heavyweight effects guy, heavyweight effects guy, you know, right. huge resume, well known. And I was like, oh, there's no way they're going to call us at all. But it was like, no, no, we, we, we want you involved. So I go and meet Kevin, which is very intimidating. Um, and he was like, look, I want to see your portfolio, not your companies and see what you can do. And, uh, and, even, and, and years later, when I, I got to know Kevin quite well, we're, we're no longer friends. <laughs> to say the least, uh, but uh, but uh, and I will elaborate if you like. But uh, yes. but um, we uh, at the time I remember saying, "Why didn't you use somebody else?" And he's like, "Oh well, you know, I don't want to use I didn't want to use LA effects artists, and I wanted someone who had a connection to the Hellraiser, the Pinhead character, and I felt you would do a, a better job." And blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So loved the script, thought the script was really really cool, and um, we started. We, we, you know, Kevin wanted to do certain effects. He wanted to do the Chatter Beast. He wanted me to do the Cenobites. Um, he did wanted to do certain kills. It was all fine by me. He had some great crew on it. Really great guys who I know to this day and still work with. Um, but what I noticed very quickly was Kevin had done a lot of towers from the crypt, and um, he got a lot of the crew on from that, the DP on from that, and the first AD. And um, what I noticed very early on was it was a very colourful movie and a bit, a bit camp and a bit a bit like towels from the crypt you know like episodes of towels from the crypt and i was yearning to see a more gritty dirty and nastier approach and like kevin had a very young daughter at the time and like he he had his daughter visit on set and you know i remember him directing like with his daughter bouncing on his knee and me thinking you know if you're going to do hellraiser you know it should be a pretty a pretty nasty environment and pretty you know Jack daniels uh, <laughs> yeah well just just, just, just <laughs> yeah, a lot of sexual taboo and weirdness Right. Um, and then the film didn't look very, it looked very TV. Uh, Francis Kenny was the initial DP who did like Clueless and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And uh, I think the Daily Star is showing up. And I think Weinstein was like, this doesn't look like a Hellraiser movie. So Kevin really fought for Francis Kenny and they said no. And they brought in Greg, Li uh, Jerry Lively, who did Hellraiser 3. Um, and then he's, and then basically what happened was we had a whole bunch of things go wrong. The, the kid got chicken pox. We had a union strike halfway through the movie. Um, it was all, it was a lot of nights. And I think a lot of the crew were TV people who were used to working on pretty comfy shows. And it was a horror film. So I was in my element. I was completely fine. And Kevin was relying on me a lot and saying, hey, can you, like, I remember the, like the, the scene with Pinhead in the boardroom, they'd made little lamps with barbed wire around them and stuff mm -hmm. like this. And Kevin was going, have you seen this stuff? It looks ridiculous. It's like, you know what Hellraiser looks like. Can you help me? Can you tell them what to do? And I went to the production people and was like, you know, have you seen the Hellraiser movie? And they were like, oh no, we don't like those kind of films. And it was like, what? You know, what's going on? And the producer wasn't very hands-on. She would just turn on late at night, turn up late at night and just complain and moan. So it got to be a very, a very miserable set very quickly. And I think what happened was, well, I know what happened was actually, uh, the, the, what basically came down was the film finished and Kevin was a DGA director, which means he's, by DGA law, he's allowed 10 weeks to edit the movie. And I think they started editing and Bob Weinstein said, I want to see a cut, you know, like within two weeks, just to have to see a rough cut. And Kevin was like, no, you have to wait 10 weeks. And Bob was like, no, I want to see something right now, you know, like, you know, you know, I'm the producer, you know, I want to see the movie. And Kevin stood, stood his ground and said, no, DGA law says I'm allowed to have 10 weeks. Basically, you know, you're not going to fucking see anything rather than, you know, bending kind of like treating Bob as an ally. He just decided to go toe to toe with him. And that's a fight you're never going to win. So Bob obviously couldn't make him do it because it's against DGA rule. So basically by that point, you'd pissed off Bob Weinstein. So by the time the 10 weeks, had, had elapsed and he showed him their cut they were like we don't like it thank you very much you can move along now you're done mm -hmm. because he kind of just pissed them off had he maybe said you know what give me three weeks i'll show you a couple of rough scenes or something 
uh, you've got to know how to work with the studio, especially with the Weinsteins. You know, like now, when I when I used to cut stuff, when I direct a movie, the first thing I do while I'm shooting the movie is I cut together a trailer or a teaser scene so that literally the day you finish, you can send them something and they go, oh, this looks great. Great, right. have your 10 weeks or have six weeks. You know, but I don't think Kevin, I think Kevin treated them as enemies, not as allies. And, uh, and, and he alienated the studio. So by the time when they could cut him loose, they cut him loose. Well, and, and you know, I I don't want to seem controversial here, and I don't know if I if you agree with me here, but Christian and I are both big fans of Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, and that was yeah. Joe Chappelle. And I would just say, I think some of the best stuff in Bloodline is from when Joe Chappelle came on. Personally, oh no, it is without doubt, without doubt. And um, it wasn't only Joe. What was really key was Joe had a DP. I can't remember his name. His name now, New York guy, who was really cool, really really cool. He had some great ideas. But uh, for those who don't know, if you watch Bloodline, predominantly all of the uh, open, the first act is Joe Chappelle. Most of the finale is Joe Chappelle. The middle section in LA is a lot of what Kevin shot. <clears throat> you know, the kind of like uh, the normal modern family stuff is a lot of Kevin. Um, um, and some of the space stuff. But all that opening of the birth of Angelique and all that, that was all Joe. That best part of the movie oh, act one there, yeah I yeah act so. one's the best part of the movie period I but so. i agree i agree um but, and that was not what happened was was we did so we, we was a six-week shoot brutal six-week shoot and then it was like we came back in january and we did two weeks and then we came back at three four months later and did another two weeks and then we came back and did another two weeks i mean you've got to give uh one since they the credit now they, they pumped money into it they kept trying to fix it but uh, it became just a hodgepodge at that point. You know what I mean? It was kind of like a lot of cooks in the kitchen and um, yeah. and then trying to fix it. So uh, it, it's, it's you know, and uh, it, I mean, it's still, I think, the highest. It was a huge opening at the time. I think it opened like $6 million or something. But, no um, kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a, a thing somewhere that says, like, you know, I got like a congratulations and it was like biggest Hellraiser opening ever. So there yeah, were, was there was it was weird That's to see the franchise go straight to video after that because Bloodline didn't perform poorly, but I know that there was, was a lot of I don't of think it's things. that. I think what happened was, uh, because I know for a fact what happened was, Hellraiser for the Weinsteins was, for Bob, not the Weinsteins really, because Harvey had nothing to do with it, Bob. Uh, Hellraiser was always a tricky fit for them because it was... Um, you know, they, they kept saying, write a Hellraiser script, but no sex and no no leather Cenobites and no... No sadomasochism no in my Hellraiser they, movie. Because what they... I think they, they got a hold of, a, uh, of a, um, a, a, a property that really they didn't understand. And uh, what they then had halfway through, like, I mean, you have to remember when Hellraiser Bloodline came out, Scream came out very shortly afterwards, and Scream just made so much money and was such a simple formula for them. It was like, oh... We want more of this, you know. We it don't want any again, of this yeah. weird, creaturey, cenobite, leather-bound, sadomasochistic stuff. Let's just have teens in peril being chased by a guy with a, a knife, and they could never squeeze Hellraiser into that. So I don't think they they just couldn't figure it out. I mean, that's why it kind of became the lackluster vehicle it became. And really, I mean, that's why it's so nice to see with the you know the the new Hellraiser that oh, it I'm seems so excited. Super yeah, so it seems to have a completely yeah. fresh, fresh look to it, and uh, it, it looks dark and scary and creepy. And it uh, looks like there's fucking money behind it. Looks it. like Hellraiser. Yes, it does. but it looks like a different kind of Hellraiser. But it looks yeah, right. it's big and bold, and but also well, just kind of turned on its side and given a creepy edge. And mm. you know, I have to be, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm a little jealous, you know, I'm a little jealous to say the least. But, uh, but I have nothing but best wishes, and I'll be there, you know, October the seventh, uh, you know, on my Hulu. Uh, uh, really excited. I mean, uh, I'm I'm really looking. I, and I and I'm gonna was. I'm gonna ask you a follow up to that. We we got about 20 more minutes with Gary. We will touch on Hellraiser 2022 at the very end here. But you know, we we go through the straight to DVD hell period there, and I've heard you talk about it. So we won't really touch much on it. You worked on all those movies, and for better or worse, whether it be script issues, director issues, whatever budget issues, always. The Cenobites, the makeup effects were always on point. I, I love the, the the designs in Inferno. Um, Hellseeker is probably one of my least favorite movies simply because they brought Ashley back just to waste her. Um, and, uh, you know, Deader, I think the first two acts of that movie are decent. And then forcing Doug and the Cenobites in it just didn't fit. Um, yeah. 
And then you said, I've heard you talk about how you did not have fun with Hell World. Like by oh, the time you got to Hell World, you were like, I'm fucking done with this shit. Like, well, it wasn't that. It was just that we were, the problem with Hell World was, um, you know, we were in uh, Romania shooting Deda and we knew we were going to shoot, um, you know, Hell World next. And there just uh -huh. wasn't a script. We literally had a, two weeks in between, um, uh, you know, finishing Deda and going on to Hell World where it was like we were sitting in a room going, so what should we do? And people were kicking around ideas. And I mean, and as a Hellraiser fan, you're going, please don't do that. That's a terrible idea. And and it was like everybody and their dog was throwing an idea on the on the, on the the table and like suggesting stuff. And then the script was written <laughs> super quick and it was like bang out some effects. And I mean, the thing about all the Hellraiser sequels, I would say, is this is that, look, you know, everybody went into it with, you know, like the best of intentions trying to do a, you know, a good job. I don't think Rick Botu, I mean, Rick's a lovely guy, but I think they should have mixed it up in terms of directors and uh, given someone else a shot at it. Um, Rick clearly devoted his time and energy to Deda and kind of just knocked out Hellworld, you know. Yeah. Um, it seemed like that. a lot of people phoned in Hellworld. A lot of people phoned yeah. in Hellworld. But the makeup effects were good, man. And that's, okay. I have, I mean, uh, you know, I have fun. The budgets, the I'm going to give you your credit, Gary. I'm going to give you your credit. Okay. There's a lot about whole world that is not good, but I think that some of the gore and effects are good. So you might've been burnt out and been like, what are we doing here? But you still put your best foot forward. And I have to give you. Oh no, it was only burnt out at the end. I just remember coming home. I just remember coming home from hell world and just saying, is that really how we're going to end this? Because it was like, I don't know if we're going to do another one. And I just remember that last line of Doug's being, oh, yep. has that for a wake up call and thinking, how dreadful is this? Like, that's where this icon has gone from, you know, uh, demons to some angels to others to how's that for a wake up call? And I was thinking, wow, it's a Freddy line. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's such a Freddy line. Such a fantastic concept and, and franchise and characters. And now it's just like, it's, it just, it, I just thought I was just sad. And that's why I came back and made the little short film No More Souls because I was like, right. I've got to try and do something that at least and, uh, I feel and like. And tell Christian about it. this. I don't know if Christian knows this, but Gary did that because Gary said, hey, they're fucking this up. And, you know, people in your inner circle said, well, why don't you do something? And Gary said, fuck it, I'll do it. And Gary puts it out. Dimension likes it, puts it on a home release. And Doug calls you. And Doug's like, what the fuck, Gary? Right. Yeah, Doug was really pissed off. Yeah, he was really angry. It was funny because it was just a, it was literally, this was kind of like in the early, I think the only fan film at the time had ever come out was like, was like um, uh, Troopers, you know, the troops, you know, the Star Wars, you uh -huh. know, uh, like on cops. So this, there was, there was no fan films. And all it was, was I just said, I was moaning and saying, I'm never going to get to direct a Hellraiser film, blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, if you, you know, why don't you write something and do it? And I was like, all right, I will. So I wrote this, what I, I knew I could get away with shooting, which was like a six minute kind of like soliloquy of, uh -huh. of Pinhead basically in hell, post apocalypse, post apocalyptic war. And it's like, what would happen in hell if there were no more souls to process? And would the Cenobites turn upon him uh, eventually, you know what I mean? And tear him apart. Or would he just invite that to happen for one last slice of his sensation? So um, I wrote it and then it was like, well, who's going to play Pinhead? And it was like, we're in LA and Doug's in England at the time. He lives in England. And and there was no money on this. It was my money. The only money I, I built, I got my buddies to me to build the sets for free. And then I rented a camera, a, a high definition camera, because I don't know how to use a light meter and use film. So I, it was the early days of a high def. And I knew that if we had a monitor, I could look at the monitor and light to that. I lit it right. using um, work lights with homemade. I made cookies and bought gels. Mm -hmm. So it was just like a little homemade fan film. So uh, it was like, well, someone needs to play Pinhead. And it was like, well, I'm English, so I can kind of do the voice. And then uh, I'll do that. And then uh, my buddies can play the Cenobites. Mike, who plays Chattera, will play Chattera. So I shot it. And then what happened was it was just, it became a rolling stone. I shot it. And Patrick Lussier, you know, the, the editor of the Scream movies and director of Dracula 2000, and like, he saw it and was like, oh, this is cool. Like, this looks pretty cool. I'm editing a movie down the street. Give me the footage and we'll we'll edit it on the sly while they're, you know, while we're editing this movie. So I sent it down there. And then Kirk Morey, who was the post-production supervisor at Neo Art and Logic, and he's now the editor of all the James Wan films, including Aquaman. He saw it and said, oh, this is cool. Do you want a hand on the post-production? Like, I'll, you know, get it color graded and all that. And I was like, yeah, that'd Son be great. Look and, at then you. Henning Loner, and then Henning Loner saw it, who did the music for one of the Hell Races. He's like, oh, the music for you, if you like. I'm like, okay. So it was just became like everyone helping out and doing favors. And then um, I remember Rick Bota. 
actually came over to the shop and I said, hey, look at this. And I showed it to him. And Rick Boter, who'd now directed three Hellraiser films, he looked at it. And he, he I remember him looking at me and saying, uh, he said, you know what? I think, <laughs> I think in six minutes, in your six minutes short, you got more of a feel of Hellraiser than I did in three Hellraiser movies. <laughs> and I was like, really? He's like, yeah. I think you, he said, I think you just get it. He said, I never really got it. So then uh, we showed it to Nick Phillips over at, uh, D- at, at Dimension, and he was like, this is really good. Can we buy it and have it on the Dead release? And I was like, yeah. And in fact, Rick, ba- Rick Bota didn't want, want it on the uh, on the Dead release. He wanted it on Hellworld. But I thought Dead was the better film. So I said, yeah. So yeah. if you actually have the Hellraiser DVD release of Dead, if you go to one of the pages and kind of like press on the box, it shows No More Souls. And when I did it, I the credit said, you know, uh, you know, thanks to the crew. Uh, thank you to Clyde Barker for creating this brilliant world within a world. And thank you, Doug, for creating the character that budget decreed I mimic. Uh, and then yeah. like a month later or two months later, I get Doug on the phone and he's furious. He's like, how dare you? You know, I've had people telling me that you've, you know, you're playing Pinhead now. And I said, oh, what you mean on the band film I did? Like, he's like, why didn't you ask me to do it? I was like, you're in England. You know, what? I was going to fly you out, you know, to, to be in my- <laughs> In my crappy little fan film, you know, like I didn't. It's not know. crappy. It is not. I, I, I've got to give you, Gary. It's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh uh, no, it, I mean, and and then Paul, Paul Kane, who wrote the book, the Hell World and the Hellraiser movies and their legacy, he wrote to me and said, "Look, I'm writing a chapter on No More Souls." And I was like, "Really?" He's like, "Oh yeah, it deserves to be in there." He said, "It's good canon." He said, "It's well made, and you do a pretty good job of it," you know. But yeah, Doug was not happy. I had to really talk him off the ledge, and maybe that was the beginning of the. But, the start of the crumbling between me and Doug, perhaps. But uh, yeah, he was not happy. He was. He thought I was trying to undermine him in some way or steal the character from underneath. Let me ask you, Gary. It, it, this this Doug yeah. Bradley, this Doug Bradley character, is he, is he a sensitive guy? I mean, like you you talk about being a straight shooter. He strikes me as the kind of guy you could hurt his feelings. Is that the case? Uh, hurt his feelings? No, I don't think it's hurt his feelings. I think it's he hurt he definitely. But he, but okay, ego is what I'm saying, he, and he certainly feels an ownership of it, and you got to take that as somewhat of a badge of a badge of honor. Like, hey, dude, I make this goddamn, sh- you know, fan made, not fan made, because it's hard, you can't really call it fan made because you're you're so involved in the series. But you make you make this personal thing, and it gets all this attention, and you got to be saying to yourself, this is kind of awesome, right? I mean, it, it, the, the guy, the pinhead, Doug Bradley's getting pissed off because I'm making this thing that's better than half these these movies. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, mean I, never thought, I, was, I never thought it's great that Doug's pissed off. I was, I was really, I was just like, hey man, calm down. Like, you know, like this isn't, in no way was my agenda to upset you. I just made something that I thought was fun and, and really kind of like my homage to a Horizon movie. Hence the right. reason I gave you such a big credit on it. I was just, you know, I was, again, this was something that I never imagined being released or being seen. It was just kind of made amongst my friends as, as a bit of a, what, what if there was a nuclear war and everyone died, what would Pinhead do? Right. Um, and had and if if I'd shot it in England or or if Doug lived down the street, he would have one hundred percent been in it. It would have been like, Hey Doug, throw the suit on and come and do this, you know. And I'm sure he probably he would have done it, you know. Uh, but it was just geography and uh, like I say, I never anticipated it becoming what it became. Um obviously the stuff that happened later on has a very different vibe and a very different energy to it. Um right. but uh I definitely think uh Doug Doug has an ego, yeah, without a doubt. And uh, yeah, I mean, and rightly so. He's created a brilliant character that he uh, has ownership of. Um, but I also think uh, he's uh, he's been listening to the people who come and get 8 by 10s from him for way too long and has lost, I think, has yeah. lost some sense of reality of, 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 of just like, you know, it's the Elvis Presley syndrome, you know what I mean? I think if everyone's around you just telling you how great you are all the time, right. you eventually start to believe some of it. So, I mean, um, even to the point where some of the stories he tells about things, well, I I was there. I'm like, that's not what happened. You know, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe I don't record it like he did, but it's like I think he's told a story so many times that and he's got to juice it up seen, to entertain himself. Just, right. Exactly. He's seen how the audience react to it and has kind of like changed it Take- and then started to believe it. And it's like. That's not true, my friend. And I was All there, right. and I've and I've had other people who were there say the same thing. Like, you know, don't, don't, he's don't, stretching uh, this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, it's like he's yeah, exactly. But I mean, he's yeah. had to stretch it because let's face it. I mean, he hasn't done a Hellraiser movie in God knows how many years. So I mean, he's it's like you know they're telling the same stories over and over <laughs> again at every convention every weekend. It's like well, so. Gary, if, I, 
if this new movie's a hit they and they make a sequel, they got to find a way to get him to cameo. His last line is Pinhead. I, I heard be. that I heard that David Bruckner uh, wanted him to do a cameo, but they called him and offered him a cameo, and he wouldn't do it. You got to pay the man, right? They probably didn't I, want to I pay think him. They right? were going to pay him. I, I, the, I, I, the budget for this new movie, Christian, was fourteen million dollars. Fourteen million dollars. So they had the money to pay well, him. It, any... Well, it looks like they got that money on screen too. I mean, yeah, but. but... Yeah, no, I I saw it. Looks fantastic. I mean, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of revelations. Although our audience would probably find it funny, guys. Don't well, blame the, any the of that. The going to be pretty high because David Goya is not cheap. David Goya is a uh, yeah. you know a top. He's the real deal. Yeah. But also, yeah. Gary, how does this work? You know, like they're putting this on Hulu. How are they going to profit off this? I don't With know. Don't ask me. Gary's a he's a makeup effects guy. I know, I know he, he is, a, but I'm just okay. saying. Like, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> saying, it, it, Gary, living in the climate we live in now with horror. Don't you think they should have put it in theaters? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It looks gorgeous. And it deserves right? to be seen in a big dark room. You know what I mean? I mean, you want to see right. a horror film in a big dark room, and especially looking at the way it does. And I bet you, uh, I don't know David Bruckner from, uh, you know, from a, a hole in the ground, but I bet you David Bruckner would love to see it theatrically released. I bet right. you know, all directors like want to see their films released theatrically and, uh, you know, and, uh, and um, no, it looks like a cinematic movie. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Whilst everyone's got great big TVs now and cinema rooms and everything else, it would be lovely to see. And uh, I think yeah. it would do very well because obviously uh, everyone in their dog seems to know about the film now. So, yeah, I mean, and, and, and um, it's it's incredible. And I, I we got about ten minutes left with Gary. I would be it would be rem, I'd be remiss if we did not talk we can about stretch it a bit longer. If, if you want to stretch it a bit longer, okay. we can go in. Well, because I, I got to touch on the biggest part here: judgment. judgment. When the franchise what? was brought back on track in my opinion and Christian's opinion, by this man himself, wrote it, directed it, did the effects, and even got to the point where he was putting his own money into the movie because of the budgetary limitations. Is this putting correct? your own money into it? Yeah. Gary, oh, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. Putting your own money into oh, no. it. He also well, played can... the auditor, Christian. Yeah. You know the yeah. character of the auditor? Yeah. That was Gary. Well, Gary, before you get into this, let me also kind of add to what Nick was saying. Okay. You can under you can you can understand because like you know you you're the kind of guy that you live in I could tell you live in reality you don't bullshit yourself you take things for what they are and that's how you live and I could tell and I respect that cool you have to know that when you're making this film a lot of fans and a lot of people are saying here comes another one here comes Hell another yeah. one and you've got to have a chip on your shoulder like you you guys get ready cuz I cuz I'm going to tell you Gary Judgment's a damn good movie I'm not just telling you that that's a damn good hellraiser film <laughs> How, uh, what were every day you had to have been determined as hell to make like to get this stuff back on track am I right uh, what's really weird is that um, there's a German company right now called Turbine uh, who are doing a release of the uh, of, of Judgment and they're doing like a big box edition. Um, and they've asked us like, do you have footage and extra scenes and all that kind of stuff? And so it turned out Mike Regan, who works for me, he like we did. I uh, I didn't I'd forgotten I'd done it, but I did on camera interviews when we were like when I got the phone call to like direct it, and when I made the offer to Doug and getting turned down by Doug and everything, and then me in the shop building everything. Um, there was never a chip on my shoulder. I mean, it was literally just like when they called and said uh, when Joel called me and said, you know. Hey, look, and his exact words were, look, this isn't the film you should be offered. You know, this isn't the Hellraiser you should be offered, and it's not the budget you should have, and I apologize, but it's this much money. Are you still interested in doing a Hellraiser movie? And I was like, fuck, look, if you've got a Big Mac and a video camera, I'll direct a Hellraiser movie. Like, I'm a sucker for it. I'm still willing to give it a go. You know what I mean? Like, of course I'll do it. You know I mean? I, I'm, a, I'm a fan, and I, I have something to say. Um, so there's never a chip on my shoulder. No, I mean, I just genuinely wanted to try and make Hell as a film that that I thought would be interesting and uh, try and do something with it. Did we know that we were damned if we do and damned if we don't? Absolutely. I mean, horror fans are anything you're polarized about everything. So I knew there were people going to hate it. I knew that when we didn't get Doug Bradley that we would, I mean. You know, Another do, uh, I mean, hill I said, climb, right? I yeah. Said to, yeah, I said to Paul Taylor, I was like, when I heard Paul Taylor, I was like, Hey man, I'm going to make you famous, but I'm also, you know, you're going to be hated. You're going to be attacked. And, you know, even if we do a good job, you're still going to get shit from people. You know what I mean? And uh, it's going to go down fucking like a, you know, like a lead balloon. Um, what's been really, really, I mean, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think Hell, Hell Rise of Judgment is a pretty good film. I think 
had I been left to do the film I really wanted to, it would have been an, a really good movie. Uh, I think it's 60% of what I want. I was still tampered to death by producers with the dumbest fucking notes you've ever seen in your entire life to the point of where there was literally two weeks when we'd done cuts. They were like, can we just cut out all this audit stuff, this whole audit thing and the, the, you know, the, the, the typewriter and that guy, can we not just have the police thing? And I was like, you're out of your minds guys. You know, you're mental. This is the only stuff that's, this is what gives it its bite. They are so difficult to work with. And what was really annoying was the fact that when I started, started working on the movie i had one set of executive producers and because dimension was going through all kinds of shit at the time by well, the end of it i had completely different executive producers so we were having to remove people's names off the credits because they've been fired so then i so i i spent the movie at the beginning implementing notes from people which i thought were dumb you know like so it's like you get your dumb notes from you know exec number one exec number two exec number three you put them into the film and into the script they get fired and then in come three new executives and they're like, this is a really stupid idea. And I go, yeah, I know. It wasn't my fucking idea. I had put it in because of the <laughs> three guys before you assholes. And they're like, well, you should do this and do this and do this. Equally dumb ideas. Then they get fired and some other new guy turns up and says, I think you should do this. That was a really bad idea. Well, I don't know why you wrote that. And I'm like, I don't want to fucking write that. <laughs> it's a stupid idea. You know, it's, mm. um, it was a, it was a mental, it was mad. It was utterly mad. And, uh, and again, a fight to get what we got in there. And, and they, they were brutally rude at times. I mean, there are some scenes that I really wish were in the film. Um, there's a great speech by the preceptor at the end where he kind of explains why he's doing what he's doing and, you know, kind of waxes lyrical. It's the big Bond speech. It's the Hannibal Lecter speech. And I remember sitting, you know, on a, a conference call and some executive going, you need to cut all that shit. That's just a writer just writing some cool stuff for the, you know, wanting to sound cool. And I was like, Thanks. No, no offense. You know, like I'm, I'm the fucking writer. You know what I mean? Like I only wrote it, and I don't understand why they kept wanting to cut it down. They're like, make it move faster, make it move quicker. I'm like, why? You know, it's like it's, you know, what the hell it, these people let know? Breathe, let, yeah, let the, let these people enjoy it. I said, Hellraiser fans are going to want to see that. I mean, the original audit was 24 minutes long. You know, and I and 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 I didn't want to have any speaking in it. I was like, let's just have the audit for 24 minutes. Mm. My, my desire was to have a movie that for the first 24 minutes, the audience are looking at each other going, what the fuck is going on? Like, what is this shit? Even, even uh, if like, they trimmed it down, Gary, I have to say, the opening of Hellraiser Judgment is fucking disgusting. And I want yeah, well, to know... In a good way. Go, <laughs> I want to know what goes through your mind to go, I'm going to do this. Because it. I've literally watched reviews of people that have been like, the first, like the opening of this movie is hard to watch. It's fucking disgusting. And it is so disgusting, but you cannot take your eyes off. It's so interesting. You're like, yeah, what oh, is cool. happening? I'm glad you say that. See, that was the, the thing to do was, again, I always thought Clyde Barker, the key to Clyde Barker was that he would, he would shoot stuff or, de or describe stuff that was disgusting, but was at the same time was beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create a sequence. Same with the auditors that, you know, his face is lacerated to hell, but he's, he's interesting to listen to and to watch. Like, you're right. kind of fascinated by him, like, intrigued. Like, I was I was never scared of Pinhead. I was intrigued by him. Like, who right. is this guy? Um, and, and the reality with the sequence was is that, um, I mean, I had some people turn around and say, oh, it's disgusting. That's ridiculous. It's so over the top and so grotesque. Ugh, you know, I'm like, it's supposed to be hell. Like, what, yeah. what do you expect? Yeah, like, a, playing patty cake, film. you know, like, it's, it's hell. Yeah. You know, it's and to even, be, and, and Gary be... fucks with the audience too because he goes, okay, yeah, this is all the gross and gross, gross. Yeah. But, uh, oh, wow, look, guys, boobies. And you're like, oh, cool. And then they turn around and their faces are fucking ripped <sighs> off. And you're like, Jesus, you Gary. get it. You see, so you get it. You absolutely yes. get it. Someone said it was. Someone said it was sexist and misogynist. They're like, oh, you know, it's just look, it's exposing women. It's like, no, no, don't you understand what we're doing? Is we're showing you, you know, beautiful, sexy bodies, and then giving you the paradox of, but they have ripped off the ice. So, right. would you still go ahead and do the deed? Do you still find them attractive? Or you know, it's an internal debate. Do... It's an internal yeah, debate. Right. Same as, and again, I didn't, I didn't have the money to do. Um, elaborate torture sequences or do flaying of the flesh and all that kind of stuff that much so i had to do stuff that i thought was intimately creepy you know so like to me you know if you you say in a horror film oh we're going to tie someone down and chop them all up and do all that yeah it's horrible but if i said to you i'm going to tie you down and have three old ladies come in and lick you all over and then pour your own saliva down your throat Ugh. to me that's far more creepy and uh and, and we had i mean you say it's disgusting to watch but 
we had I had some pretty big grips, you know, on set. Walking off set, going, dude, this is this is fucked up. <laughs> this is fucked. Hey, I I'm gonna lose my lunch, and that's awesome. And just, uh, when I meet people for the first time, you say, "Oh, I'm gonna watch Hellraiser of Judgment." I'm always like, well, "I wouldn't eat a big meal before you watch it." <laughs> you know what I mean? But, oh man! But I mean, it's, um, it's you know, it's a lot of it's implied. I mean, I and again, it's always funny watching people's reviews where they say that people are drinking vomit and stuff like that or describing stuff that isn't in there you're like oh you, you didn't really watch no. it you know you they're not drinking that. vomit they're touching the vomit and then they're drinking the the man is being forced to drink spit and although i got to tell you they everything were, that, i do have oh. to tell you they were in the original script drinking yeah them. and they told you to cut it out didn't they in the original script there was a pipe, the pipe came down like in the center of the like a room like a like a, you know, those feeders you have in a gerbil cage, yeah, like the tube, and the, and the gerbils lap at it. And I was going to have the girls underneath it, and it was going to run all over them. And they were like, "Nah, we're not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't fucking do that, Gary." That um, and the pig, the pig fucking sequence. They, the, the, not, it wasn't a, a pig being fucked, but there's a a girl having sex with two guys in pig masks. They were like, "Cut that scene out as well." So I mean, and um, then and you've seen the you obviously you know the film, so yeah, uh, originally. You know the nightmare sequence where Damien's uh, Sean Carter's asleep and he kind of has the nightmare with the Cenobites? Yeah. Initially, the, the way that was written was is that his wife goes down on him and uh, she goes down on him and then he looks down and it's his, his brother lifts his head up and looks up at him <laughs> and, and wipes his mouth, you know. What the so, fuck? Yeah, it was supposed to be stuff that's like, what's the worst thing you could possibly imagine? He's like enjoying a blowjob and then you, it's your brother giving it to you, you know, so... <laughs> There's a lot of stuff like but, that in there, and they were just like, nah. nah but nah, I, but nah. that's the thing, though, Gary, is like, and I know Christian agrees from what Christian has said, is like, these ideas that you have show that you get it. Like, it's disgusting, it's disturbing, but you literally cannot take your eyes off of it. And like, right. the studio execs, they don't get that. They go, oh, no, no, fuck all that. That's too far. But like, these hardcore Hellraiser fans... No, I knew, we, the fans, I knew the fans would dig it. Yeah, we and, understand uh, that. And we're like, yes, shock us, terrify yeah. us, but keep us from turning away from the screen. Yeah. And then the, the thing I really wanted to do, I, I love Constantine and I love prophecy. So I I wanted, I'm, I, you know, unlike you, you're Christian. I'm completely you know, atheist. I, I, I don't go to church religion. or anything. Don't worry. That's okay. I'm not, you know. okay. But I mean, I have a belief system. But I think if you have to do a film in hell, you have to acknowledge that there's a heaven. And, right. I, and, and I loved the idea. And it was very hard for my line produ my producer, uh, Mike, who's very religious. I mean, a church-going religious guy. And he had real problems with it <laughs> because I loved the idea that, uh, that, hell, uh, that he hell was ran by heaven and used as a tool, you know, that they actively, mm. you know, they had this basically this basement of these characters and, uh, you know, they send an angel down to take care of it when things go wrong. But right. they use hell as a way to drive people towards the light, you know, and uh, they, they, they kind of use it to their, as a means to end, an end. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting concept. So that was what excited me about it. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I wanted to explore that. I mean, again, there are things I would love to have done and, uh, you know, 15 days. And I mean, our budget was $400,000 until two weeks before we shot it, when we found we had to give Clive Barker 50,000. So, you know, when you've got four hundred thousand dollars and you get cut down to three fifty, it's a kick in the teeth. So yeah. So my my my, my attitude would be a bit like this too with the new Hellraiser, which is whilst I have every you know uh, admiration for it and it looks really cool and I'm dying to see it, is you know if they've got what forty times the budget or sixty times the budget or eighty times my math's not very good, you know whatever yeah it's Me like a hundred so. times my budget right they've got a hundred <laughs> times my budget. So I, I would like to say this, and I think I'm not bullshitting you. If you'd have given me 100 times the budget, I'd have made 100 times the film. Sure. Oh, you know? no. It, Christian and I, we when we talked about this on a podcast episode a few weeks ago, we both agreed. When we went over this franchise, when we got to Judgment, we both said the same thing. The only thing holding Judgment back is the budget. That's mm -hmm. it. The ideas are there. The story is there. And even then, even then, like you still have the end where, um, God, I always pronounce is it Jophiel or Jophiel? Yeah, um, Jophiel, the yeah. angel when sh that shit, I, I believe you told in an interview that, like, that was the you used a lot, not a lot, but a good portion of the budget for those effects in the end. And because you really wanted that scene to really pop, because not only on screen is it important, but it's important to the fact that Pinhead literally gets cast out from hell. 
because yeah. of what he did. And that ending sequence is phenomenal. I mean, it's yeah, it's I mean, really it's very, really good. It ends a little it ends a little abrupt because we just kind of like ran out of we ran out of scenes. I'd like to have stretched it out even further. But I mean, uh, it was again. It was like, well, what do I do with Pinhead? I can't. I, I can't have another person just closing a box and saying go to hell or doing that. Right. You know, like I needed to do something interesting. And again, I was a bit like, what's the worst thing you can do to Pinhead? You know, what's 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 the worst thing you can do to someone in power? It's take their power away. Mm -hmm. And and then the idea would be it'd be a cool sequel would be having him get crawl his way back to the order and become the take over power again. Um, so I just thought, yeah, I loved when Doug was created into Pinhead in Hellbound. So I thought, let's reverse it. You know, we'll have him stripped of his garb. And the initial idea for it was kind of like, um, I know this is a weird, a weird uh, comparison, but you know, in um, Dark Crystal, when they strip Chamberlain, when he's like, yeah, you know, he's yeah, like, yeah, and he's against the wall and he's like, and they're ripping mm -hmm. all his clothes away. Right. Like the big budget version, I would have had Cenobites come out and strip him and you know, rip away his clothes and kind of like he's just nothing and they're pulling the pins out and all that kind of thing, you know what I mean? And then it would have been a, you know, he would cut to a, a a a rainy night in, you know, a city somewhere and a cop coming down the street and he's, there's a guy lying in the gutter and the cop like, whoop, whoop, on the lights and pulls him and he's like, hey, buddy, you know, we, and he gets out of his car and he flashes a light and rolls him over and it's it's Paul Taylor, you know, but he's naked, but he's still got the lacerations in his skin bleeding but no pins you know and that's where you close the movie that would have been mm. the cool way of finishing it with the budget you know what i mean uh, that's yeah. how i would have ended it but, and um, and i gotta say you know christian I, I i hope you agree with me here I, we haven't really talked about it before but like obviously nobody is doug bradley but no, what no. paul taylor i i, I respect his he was great he, he was, was great he was very good in the role and gary you said in an interview, you've said it multiple times, that you talked to Paul and you were basically like, I want your pinhead, your hell priest to be different. That way people can distinguish the two of you. That way it's not like, hey, I'm Doug Bradley Light. Like, it's no, not an imitation. You are, right? yeah, you're Paul Taylor's pinhead. Yeah, I think, well, I think uh, it wouldn't be fair to just say, hey, can you watch these tapes of Doug Bradley and just be Doug Bradley and put on a, a Doug Bradley voice? I felt initially, actually, I might have thought that, like, hey, can I just get a guy to just be as Doug Bradley-esque as possible? Mm -hmm. But um, the idea I wanted was kind of like this bored, a feat kind of character. is a bit kind of... In fact, the, the reference we kept using was, um, even on set, we'd use um, Grand Moff Tarkin, you know, Peter yes. Cushing from Grand Moff Tarkin. Mm -hmm. And occasionally, yep. Paul would get a little bit big in his role, and I'd go and go, I'd just go, you're far too trusting. And he'd go, oh, yeah, you're far too trusting, you're far too trusting. And they'd be like amateurs, you know, and he'd be very, you know... Right. You know, and he loved that final speech. And I think that's a, uh, you know, I mean, it sounds really arrogant for me to say, oh, I think that's a great speech. But I do love that stuff at the end when he's like, it's great. when he it's kind great of is. teaches Joe Phil a lesson, he's like, it's time you learned a little of the management, the matters you wish to manage, you know. And then he says, are you the way, you know, after he shoved all the pins in her head yes. and she looks like right Because it's a homage of obviously the crown of thorns of Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. And some, some people think that she says so pinhead. But he, 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 people were like, oh, I can't believe that she calls him Pinhead. And she she doesn't. Even though in the subtitles, they, they put it as so Pinhead. She actually says, so be it. You know, so. Um, I always thought it was so be it as well. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, it is, you know? mm -hmm. But again, it was supposed to be a mock crucifixion. But she's already kind of, you know, and, and that's why like when she says my order has already been, you know, uh, she says, you know, you know, do you know who I am? You know, my order has already been. Uh, mm -hmm approved and she and you actually hear a, a, a like a, a a bell tolling and that's why the audience is like you know i don't think you should have done that <laughs> well I, I, that's the, that's the thing though i wanted to say like as somebody that was raised christian i don't know what it is but like how how much these movies test that i love it mm -hmm. i mean i genuinely do love that because it's like i love the it, you know, whether it's Hellraiser 3 where Doug is like, this is my body, you know, and it force feeds the priest. And then, you know, like you said in Judgment, like, are you the way? Like, and the mock oh, well, and I, Just to say, I, I, I really did my homework in the with the Bible stuff. I was I was raised uh, Methodist, Christian. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I uh, went to Sunday school and did all that when I was a kid. So, uh, I went back and uh, the auditor stuff when he says, you know, you shall... Uh, purge from yourself the guilt you have committed because it, what, you've, what you've done is right in the eyes of the law from Ecclesiastes. You know, I mean, all that stuff. Same as Jafil. If you look up Jafil, Jafil's a real angel. She is the angel yep. who was the, 
who cast them out of the Garden of Eden and, uh, you know, was watching over Noah and his children. Uh, that's why Pinhead makes that joke about the incestuous children. Uh, so mm -hmm. there was a lot of uh, religious lines in there. When Pinhead tastes the, the square of flesh, you know, the, from the page, he actually does a line from the sacrament. You know, this is my body, feast upon my, you know, mm -hmm. no, this and you know I. Uh, so, yeah, I try to be, uh, you know, uh, honor the Bible. Same as Preceptor, you know, Preceptor's, um, you know, uh, you know his, his stuff is, uh, he's, he's, he's on point as well. Because, again, I think it's it's great text and it has weight in the, in these movies, I think, when it's, uh, what, what a lot of it came back to is when I was a kid and I saw The Omen, I remember going and finding revelations and finding that chapter and going, oh, my God, this is really in the book, you know, in the Bible, you know, uh, you know, uh, let man have no understanding, you know, you know, the number of the beasts kind of thing. And so I wanted to do the same thing with judgment. I wanted people to be able to go and go, is that a real character? Or is there really an angel called Jaffe? It and, is. Uh, yes. And, and, and is that line, you know, uh, you know, uh, in the Bible? And it's like, you know, so, yeah. So I tried, you know, I, I tried to. It's way too stuff, I think. <laughs> I, I, I'm just telling you, man, to, to everybody listening, if you guys have not seen Hellraiser Judgment because you were turned off after Revelations, please change that because Judgment was clearly made by somebody that knows what the fuck they're doing and cares about this series. And it shows. It absolutely okay. shows. You also yeah. got to direct a I mean, cameo. I would of, say to people, look, I think I would say, again, what I, what's really lovely is I get so many people coming to me and go, you know what? I, I saw Judgment and uh, I have to tell you, you know, like I, I thought it was going to be part of shit, and it's actually pretty good. So I think <laughs> you go in with an open mind, not expecting, like, you know, it's no way it's, it, I mean, I'm always shocked when people go, well, it's nowhere near as good as the first film. It's like, well, of course it's not going to be as good as the first film. Are you mad? I can't make a film like that. But if I can, if I can get my $350,000 movie into the top five L raises, then I'm absolutely thrilled, you know. You and, have. Oh, dude, it's You up have. There. Yeah, you have. And and uh, honestly, though, this might be sacrilege, but Christian and I both prefer Hellbound to the first movie. But that's yeah, just yeah, because how that. wild Hellbound got. You Hellbound know, you got is. The Labyrinth, a, Leviathan, all that shit. Hellbound is the, the best thing, of the, the 80s, only, man. The only negative I have with Hellbound is that I think it, uh, it really got our dicks wet a little bit with the um, oh, a fight. Like when he says that line of oh a fight, um, I think everyone was like, Oh fuck yeah, this is gonna be great. Like <laughs> right. Chenard versus the Cenobites, like it's on now and it's over all too quickly and too uh, right. you know in a matter of seconds. So um that was the only thing that always let me down. But apart from that, yeah, absolutely, and uh brilliant dialogue from Peter and a great character with Julia, you know, and uh mm, again, yeah. top top quality effects. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of Hellbound and uh uh I remember working with Nick Cage, and Nick loves Hellbound. He watches it every year. So he'd be like, I love Hellbound, Gary. It's great. You're kidding me. Like, oh, we're no. talking Nick Nick Cage loves Hellbound? Nicholas Cage loves Hellbound. He plays it, him and his son watch it, I think, every year. So he's, he's like, once a year, I always watch Hellbound at least once. You know? What did you well, hey, You what tell you... Nick Cage to reach out to Christian. He's a huge fucking fan. Oh, I love Nick. What did you do with Nick Cage? Drive Are you just friends? Drive anger. Oh my yep. God. You've done everything. I was looking at I was looking at your IMDB earlier too. And if you don't mind well, me asking Nick, one one last Nick, little thing. Yeah. Ask me, whatever you, you like. You just were keep going, talking until I say I'm done. Okay. You <laughs> it says that you were the effects guy for Rave to the Grave and Necropolis. No, it's her living. No, game. no. Uh I worked on that. It basically, oh God, that was a, that was a wild time. I, my, I read the book on those movies and it said basically well, it's called <laughs> it's called the complete history. I'm a diehard Return of the Living Dead fan, like we talked cool. about earlier. And I read this book called The Complete History of Return of the Living Dead, right. and I read all about those movies. How William Butler wrote this script that was going to be this big thing, and then eventually got bought by this cheap little company, and they basically spread one budget over two films right. for Rave to the Grave and Acropolis. And there was a really mean cinematographer on the first one. Am I? Am I? Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm. A, no, nobody else besides me and you probably know this, but. Can you talk a little bit about that? This is just for me, really. Some of my audience would love to hear this, but this is really for me. I would love to hear anything you can tell us. All, all about I know this. is this: I, uh, I again, as I was, my my wife's Romanian, so I was bouncing back and forth between LA and Romania, and I just finished on Exorcist: The Beginning, right? So uh, I was going over to see my then girlfriend in Romania. Mm -hmm. So I bounce over to Romania, and I'm there, and Mike Miesma, who's an effects guy, calls me and says. Dude, we're doing. Uh, we're over in Romania shooting at Castel Film, which is where I've been working. 
He's right. like, we're doing the uh, we're doing the two, you know, Return of the Living Dead movies. Uh, John Bullich is heading the effects team, and Larry O'Dean's here, and Greg Funk, and uh, and they're like, he's like, do you want to come and work on it? Like for a couple of weeks, we'll pay you this much money, and it was actually really good money. I was like, oh, really? okay. Yeah, it was actually no really kidding. good. Money. Yeah, it was actually a pretty decent. They paycheck. gave they gave all the budget to Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Not to me. I was so I'm just a lackey. So I go over and I'm like, uh, so what do you want to do? And they're like, you know, do you want to do a headcast on this guy? And I do a headcast. And then it was like, so there's a, 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 a I did a severed head of one guy. He's like got a beard and gray hair, and I did that. And then and then it was like going on set and applying makeups. But the problem was is that the effects guys, John Village. It was literally like working with Motley Crue. They were going out every night and getting hammered drunk out of their fucking brains. I mean, I like to party, I do, but by the fourth or fifth night in a row of going out and drinking till dawn and then having to get into a, a bus and go and work at 9 a.m., I mean, they were just, people were starting to reek of alcohol. And uh, and I said to my girlfriend, I was like, these guys are fucking mental and it's going to end in an unholy train wreck. And, um, and, of course, it was going to be all nights and hundreds of zombie extras and blah, blah, blah. So uh, eventually I kind of bowed out. I was like, hey, guys, I have to leave. I kind of get it. I have to kind of get out of it. But then I sp- kept in touch with Mike, and uh, I heard that just things were an uh, absolute nightmare and that it was right. all over the place. And um, the director has a weird name, a weird name like like Elon or Eron or what, the director of those movies. Yeah, I know the guy. I, I'm looking at his face right now, but he, he does have a weird he's name. He's got like a strange name and uh, – yeah, it was just very unorganized and some dodgy people on set with the producers, like Russian kind of, you know, like dodgy money. And they were suggesting we go to um, Chernobyl to go and shoot some sequences. And they're like, do you want to come to right. Chernobyl? I was like, fuck no, I'm not going to Chernobyl. You know, like no way. Uh, yeah. But then I heard that the makeup guys, my buddies, actually had a fist fight on set on like the last day. Or the I read about day. that. And we're rolling around in the dirt, punching each other. So it was it was bound to happen because there was a lot of drinking. And I heard that it had gone from them drinking like in the evenings to at that point the whole crew were just drinking all the time, and it got That's pretty awesome. rowdy and pretty crazy. But um, yeah, it was it's it's weird when you do a couple of days on a movie and then that, that a credit pops up. Like for the longest time, I used to get people go, "Hey man, you know, like uh, Gary Tunnicliffe, you know, makeup artist of um of uh of um." wolverine origins and i got i did one day on it i did one day applying a take the credit you know, like, take the credit gary take that. the credit <laughs> yeah, I did. yeah but i did i did that deadpool makeup on on ryan for one day and i oh, and yeah. most films again i usually tend to do big you know like i'm on up for the whole movie like sleepy hollow i was on for nine months you know so interesting about sleepy hollow sees i worked on sleepy hollow and worked with johnny depp and then i worked with amber heard on drive angry so mm. You know, I can tell you for a fact that everything that you have heard recently is completely true, and that uh, he's like he is, uh, and she's like she is. And it's, uh, it, I was so glad when it all finally came out because trust me, uh, it was annoying at the beginning when uh, it went down and was the other way around because I was like, no, that is not Johnny, and she is, uh, in my opinion, not a very nice person. So uh, no, no, we we we, in the end. we are uh, we. I think both of them made mistakes, but I'm firmly in the Johnny's a far better person than Amber is. And, and uh, that's... having spent time with Johnny and around Johnny and seeing him with people and the way he treats people, uh, there are uh, he's one of the nicest guys on the planet. Absolutely, time for everybody. And uh, he used to do great things on Sleepy Hollow for um, uh, Make a Wish Foundation and stuff like that, and had time oh, for, for him. He's, I remember he's a... my girlfriend came over at the time and. Uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, I was 27 or something, 28. And I, you know, my, my girlfriend, I'm, I'm, I'm on set and I'm like, oh, do you want to meet Johnny? And she's like, do I want to meet, do you want to want to meet Johnny? Yes. And she's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. Don't. So I walk her over and Johnny's like, who's this, Gary? He's like, hello. And he's, and this is Claire. He's like, oh, do you want some candy? Do you want some to eat? And uh, she's like, yes, please. And, uh, you know, and then he said, do you want to see the f- sets? He said, do you, want, do you want to see the sets? He's like, Gary's it okay if I show Claire the sets. And, I'm like, okay, and he just he spent like 20 minutes taking her around the sets and showing her all the sets and everything and came back and she's like, I just spent 20 minutes walking around with Johnny Depp and he was just lovely, you know, and wasn't creepy or weird, just a genuinely nice guy and said how great you were and and uh, he was just like that. He's just a really cool guy to hang out with and a funny guy. Nice. Very self-deprecating and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, n- n- and, and lovely. I mean, there was an incident where I was working with him and I got the... Uh, I was in the water working and I got kind of really cold and 
they were all like, get Johnny Warm, get, you know, get, get Johnny <laughs> Get <Coffin."> Johnny Warm. <laughs> and he was like, stop, hold on a second, Gary, let's get Gary Warm. Gary's in the water, cold, let's get him. Here, have my coffee. Let's give him my coat, you know, and uh, yeah, he was a really a cool cat, really cool I'll cat. Be, well, I'll be it, down. All I got to say to that is that Disney has no idea what they're doing with uh, walking away from him with Pirates of the Caribbean. It's going to crash and burn, and uh, that's sad. But, uh, Gary, one last thing before we let you go. Um, I know that we talked a bit about it, the new movie coming out uh, in a a week and a half. Um, I want to ask you as a makeup effects guy, how do you feel about these designs in the trailer? I mean, you see Penhead is a lot of missing flesh and looks like uh, they're not wearing clothing. And then mm. I love the design of the new Chatterer. What do you yeah. think of these designs? Um, my initial reaction when I saw Pinhead, the first time I saw it from the front, uh, I thought um, that was really clean and very cool. Very nice. Um, when I saw it from the side, we used to have problems with the Pinhead makeup. And we did things to alleviate it where you get a lot of pins built up on the side of the head because when the grids tend to c- converge, you get a big bold, a, lo- a lot of pins tend to build up. So you tend to, we tended to do a weird pattern. So I did notice they, they're having the same thing there with the buildup of pins, but it looks really clean and really cool. And obviously the, the idea they've gone for with the kind of the body stuff is very cool. My first reaction to the mask Cenobite wasn't great. I, I thought it looked a bit, um, I don't know, very tortured souls kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chatterer makeup is very straight at the comic book. I mean, uh, kind of classic comic with that very sleek, pulled down look. I mean, the work I think has been done. I mean, I know the people who've done the work and some brilliant artists were involved, people like Mikey Rodella and Dave Grasso and Jerry Mariello and real top-notch talent. They brought in some really good people. So I have uh, no doubts that that stuff's going to look spectacular. The only thing I've always thought and I could be completely wrong, is that I've always found that um, naked characters are somehow seem prone to me or seem weakened slightly. That somebody who's naked, uh, whilst there is a strong effect of it, it can be a little bit, um, make them seem a little fragile. But I think it's just going to, I think I think it, the way that Brooklyn is going to make it look, he's just inherently creepy and, and, mm-hmm. and disgusting, which is the way, the way it seems to look. Um and I was initially, I've grown to get used to it now, but her voice didn't sit well with me initially. Um, but I'm, I'm being so nitpicky, you know what I mean? Um, no, yeah, that, w- that was the one thing I told Christian. After we saw the design of all the Cenobites, I thought it looked good. I said, I just need to hear the voice. And I've got to say, I love the mixture of the, it's there. there's femininity there, but there's also a disembodiment to the voice mm-hmm. that I'm, I'm really loving. But e- it, not so much the voice, I love the lines that uh the hell priest gave in that trailer you know when she says at the end of the trailer what is it you pray for i was just like oh yeah. fucking gorgeous like and apparently yeah, the line i liked was that although the, i like the line we wish to we wish you to continue i think she said i thought yeah. that was cool and, and apparently like it's well apparently like it's timeline it's yeah bit, and, and like uh you know how trailers could be that's probably that's probably cut from something else maybe um but I Jamie did say that she gets to deliver one of the iconic pen headlines in this movie, oh, and she won't say what it be. is. What do you think it is? Oh, it's uh, oh, you open the box, we came angels to others, a demons. Yeah. To some no, no, angels no, to others. I, yeah. I think it's going to be we are demons to some angels to others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was I, thinking I think it. Yeah, a lot of people you know. think that. I was also thinking we have such sights to show you, but I was like, no, it probably is the demons to some. Like it, it just. Yeah. My, my, I think if we were going to do a poll, I'd be like, my top one would be number one would be uh, demons to some, angels to others, because I think Goya would say that's a great line. Uh, we have such sights to show you. Possibly, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, but 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 Gary, my favorite. Too, right? One of my favorite lines oh. ever delivered by Pinhead is. Um, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, now, I and know. I think uh, you know. Uh, but the other one I always thought was great was, uh, but trick us once again, and your suffering will be legendary even in hell. Yeah. Right. Oh my God. And also, can't can't discount the uh, the great line of, uh, "Do I look like someone that uh, cares what God <laughs> thinks?" <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, yeah. I'm like, that's that's pretty fucking good. That that's good. Yeah. Um, no. Peter Atkins used to write great lines. He, yeah. he did, Peter Atkins always so it, lines. if this was a success and say, you know, 
next month they call you Gary and they say, we want you back. We want you back. We want, I mean, I'm not, I'm, you know, just like, like humor me here. If they were like, we want you back, do the makeup for the sequel. Are you game? Like, let's oh, do it. Fuck you. Are you kidding? Of course yeah. they would, but they won't because Russell, I think Russell effects have done a, looks like they've done a fantastic job. And I understand to a degree. I mean, honestly, the funny thing is if, if, um, I'm, I suppose, I'm, I'm sure they probably thought I was too ingrained in the uh, process. But if, if Russell FX or someone would have called me and said, hey, Gary, look, I know this is probably insulting, but would you be interested in, like, applying? Just, you know, applying masks and or helping out? I mean, I, I live in Romania, so Serbia was very close to me. If, if someone had made a reach out, I would have I would have gone and been, like, a, a runner or an assistant just to be on the movie and to be there. Because, again, I'm a, fan of, I'm a fan of Hellraiser. I'm a fan of, you know, true blue fan. So... I think initially when I saw stuff, there's a little party that goes, oh, I hope it's not good. I hope it's a flop, you know, and that people go, oh, Judgment was actually really quite good. But then when I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, that's fucking great. I was like, that looks mm. really cool. And and it's just, I, mean, I love that. I mean, clearly the character's the engineer, you know, the guy who's like, you know, um, you know, uh, well, I do, you know, I, you know, and like the little smile he gives when the guy, you know, opens the box. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I love, I love that. And I, and I, and I love, I love the way the box moves and uh, did you like, notice the that. did you notice the bells chime too yeah of course uh, yeah I, I do and everything yeah oh, no and yeah so much of it I uh, again I'm just really so I I have to uh, I have to cast away all that kind of like artisty venomous you know like oh it's not my film so I'm going to shit all over <laughs> it kind of attitude that you want yeah. that you want to have but I can't have because I just I love Hellraiser and I love Clive Barker's world so I'm just you know, I have to give in to my frothing fan and just be like, you know what? I'm just excited to see it. And if it's good, it'll be great. And I'll be, I have a, I think it was one of those things that I watched the trailer a couple of times and then I, I went to bed and dreamt about it. I actually dreamt I'd seen it and really enjoyed yeah. it. And I was like, that's great. Look, I'm actually dreaming about a Hellraiser movie. And so I'm excited to see a Hellraiser film. So in some ways it's kind of nice that I wasn't on it because I yeah. get a really fat, fresh perspective of it. Yeah, and, you, um, and you don't know what's coming. That's that's no. cool. It's like you're like I'm going into this blind kind of. I mean, I want to know what do you think about the return so, of the labyrinth so and don't... Leviathan? Yeah, um, I was never particular. The labyrinth and Leviathan never really meant that much to me. It's a big black diamond in the sky. I never, <laughs> I never really got it. I was always like, you know, like okay, that's it's an Escher drawing to me. You know what I mean? It's like Escher, mm -hmm. but if they're bringing it back, then fantastic. I mean, it's clearly got. Some great homage to the uh, second film um but um yeah i'm just uh, i'm i'm i mean i <clears throat> i i always thought that the first film the the love triangle was the amazing story the the weird you know like you know he's just trying to get away she's obsessed with him and she'll do anything to to bring him to 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 get back with him including killing people Right. Um, you know, and he's, Julia and he's gonna is the over. villain, not Pinhead. Yeah. In, in Hellraiser, well, Julia Frank. is the villain. Uncle Frank's well, the bastard. Well, Frank's they both are. Yeah, the, the, especially the in fact Hellbound. That he's completely, I don't know if, I, if, you've, if you've heard me say this, but I've always said that what I always thought Hellraiser was at its heart, and this is why it's brilliant, is it's essentially it's a mob story. You know, it's just a mob story. If you think Frank is a guy who basically uh, took money from the mob and he's on the lam. You know, and uh, the, uh -huh. the, the the guys are going to hunt him down and kind of cut him up. And he gets to his girlfriend and he's like, you know, hey, honey, even though he's dumped her and he's not, he doesn't care about it. He's like, you help me to kind of like get back to strength so I can escape and we'll run off together, you know, and you will be together, I promise you. But he's going to just dump her by the wayside and flee. Uh, and then the, the mob turn up and kind of like they're uh, they're going to do their business with him. Right. That's really what the story is, but taken to a horror level. And then you've got these great characters, the Cenobites. Um, and that's why it works because at the core it's a it's a real simple story um so i'd still love to see that you know done that hellraiser that hellraiser movie made but uh, i'm excited very excited to see what britain is and I, I like the ritual i thought the ritual was inherent that that first scene in the ritual when they go into that cabin and they all wake up and the one guy's naked and the one guy's pissed himself i mean that's a really freaky scene. how it's good cool. was that damn movie the ritual yeah, that movie yeah. that movie kind of fucked me up to be honest with you my wife was freaking out with that 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 was good shit man and, and Gary, imagine still... if, you us out, if, you, if you freaked us out with the ritual which is just you know some stuff in the woods imagine what he's gonna do with hellraiser so uh, oh, again really okay see now i'm putting two and two together the director's name wasn't really ringing a bell mm -hmm. but the ritual was 
that the, that movie was that that movie was great. So now I'm really excited. I gotta say though, like I was always a fan of like the Judas Priest S and M outfits. Though, like I can understand making it different. I loved the black leather and the hooks. I like the Cenobite, the heavy set one with the glasses that go into the side of his head. Butterball, butterball. butterball that's my favorite one. Butter yeah, but Christian. Bad. Don't think that they're not in this. I posted that screenshot from the trailer to you and Brandon the other day. I don't know if you noticed this, Gary. There's a scene of a girl spinning on something at a park, and you get a quick mm -hmm. glimpse of the Cenobites in the distance, and it looks like Pinhead mm -hmm. is wearing a getup. I, I like the black. Yeah, it it looks. I think it, the idea is that it's some, some stitched, some it's stitched into the into the flesh. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. I mean, I I think. I, I do love the designs, but again, I, I'm like you. I do love the uh, the black leather. I mean, the butchers from hell, as uh, as Clive called them, yeah, sadomasochistic butchers from hell. So uh, I think you know you, you'd redesign them more for the uh, for now. But uh, yeah, I still I, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing some of the black leather in there. And I, I did some designs earlier on uh, for um, for Patrick Lucier's uh, Hellraiser, and we did some interesting stuff that was kind of very tight fitting and more exposed flesh. And we did a whole thing where. Pinhead was in kind of a really high collar and part of his face was inside the collar. And then he would remove this, this headpiece would be removed and you would see his oh, neck man. and that. Oh my God. And those I, are quite fun. So uh, there were several versions of Hellraiser at Dimension that never got made that they were looking at high budget stuff. I mean, and uh, do you know if the they're process. still doing that TV series with David Gordon Green? No idea. I, I know that there's some issues with rights that uh, the rights are kind of all over the place. I, I'm I sure that don't, I kind of don't want it. I mean, I saw this trailer for this new movie, yeah, and I'm I like, think let's just stick with this. Think, right. I think if they were to take the best stories from the book, from the, from the graphic novels, and, uh, you know, and maybe um, and do it so it's not it's not necessarily Pinhead and the Cenobites, it's just the stories from the graphic novels, the best of them, and do it, you know. I mean, if they were to do that with a decent-sized budget, I think it could be really cool. I mean, the, the, Hellbound, the, the Hellbound Heart, the the iter, the initial iteration of this is is a beautiful novella. I mean, I, it mm -hmm. really is a great read. And I don't. I used to read a lot. I don't read so much anymore. That's the problem of having cell phones and getting things at your fingertips and whatnot. But you know, the Hellbound Heart. I would put it up there with books like Stephen King's It and stuff that are just some oh, of yeah. my favorite books of all time. Um, but did you did you read the graphic novels? I did not. No, but I, I've I've seen I've the graphic seen them out novels are great. The, the graphic novels are so cool because there's you know there's medieval time stories and yeah. stuff in there. You know, they're yeah. all through different ages in the sixties and the fifties, and it's like you could you could you know you could do period pieces and uh, you know the Knights Templar finding the box and opening it, and there's these Cenobites that are from the you know from that age and stuff, and it's it's such a it's got such a, a mythos to it. That that box is really what the uh, the 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 legacy is about and you can follow that through the ages you know and, uh, and yeah. have fun with mm. it you know you don't need to you know so yeah yeah i mean i think a, a series could be cool yeah can well, i ask one yeah, last question ahead, gary and ahead. it's not a question where you got to elaborate too long i'm gonna give you three more questions three more questions okay we'll that's fine so gary i want to go back take me to take me back to halloween resurrection because there's a lot here's the thing there's a lot of mystery with this movie for the fans gary now i know that you got interviewed for the new 4K coming up from Scream Factory, I which, which I can't wait to watch. I, I'm gonna tell you something, Gary. I laugh at Resurrection. I have fun with Resurrection. I think it's a funny movie. And so, in this book I read called Taking Shape, I two things that I found of interest that I'd love for you to give me some clarity on, if you can. Sure. If the I first can. thing, the first thing I read was that Buster Rhymes essentially like he in the book it said that he basically wrote his own he changed his own dialogue and nobody could stop him in a sense and i also read that the test screenings this this shocked me because gary in today's halloween fandom the fans hate buster rhymes for a couple reasons they think he can't act and he kicks michael yeah. myers yeah. right right or wrong Kind of rightfully so. I mean, for God's sakes, it's one of the greatest horror villains of all time, and he gets karate chopped by Buster Rhymes. Okay. I think it's funny, but I can understand why the fans are pissed. But I read that during the test screenings for this movie, the audience notes said, Give us more Busta Rhymes. Can you verify? Too, yeah. Can you verify both of these claims that this book made? Uh, the first one is that Buster, yeah, would make up his own lines, absolutely. 
I think all that crispy, crispy fried chicken motherfucker was all busted. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, yeah, I mean, he was a, I mean, look, he was a very, he was a happy go lucky kind of guy, you know, but I mean, he's clearly not, you know, uh, a great actor with, you know, with any chops. I mean, he was just kind of like turn up and do his thing. But yeah, I, I don't think he learned his lines either. So he just kind of tends to just bumble them out, you know. So I mean, um, he was all over the place. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not a great thespian. I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think anyone in the academy was like, maybe Buster Rhymes. Um, but but a nice, amicable chap and, you know, and uh, easy to work with. I mean, um, regarding the test screenings, I mean, I, 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 it, again, it's one of those things that you mentioned. And I think maybe I did hear that from one executive where I don't know if it, everybody was like, give us more Buster Rhymes. I think Bob might have been like, give us more Buster Rhymes. Um it's just a weird, a weird situation when you're doing a film like that because I think on set we knew that it was slipping away from us a bit. You know what I mean? Like I think when Buster turned up and you're just watching him do his dialogue, you're all like, "This, this, this stinks, it, it, right? This is bad." Right? But you is know? anybody saying anything? Is I mean, I'm, I'm assuming Rick Rosenthal was just like, "I love it. Let's go." I mean, Rick. I think I mean, Rick. I think Rick was like uh i i love rick and uh i mean rick had medals made that had uh the royal order of the clusterfuck written on them and was giving them out to key members of the staff because he was like that's what this is because he was getting so notes he was aware daily. then yeah oh yeah absolutely i think he was just like look i'm getting paid a lot of money to yes. do this amount so i'm just gonna fucking turn up and do what i can because he was getting calls every day to be like do this do this do this do this change this we want this so i think he was just like you know uh, i'm just I, all i can do is show up and do the job um i mean the funny story i could, i think i've told this story many times but uh the classic story was there was a, there was a the, the kind of executive in charge on that film for dimension was a guy called lou spiegler and he's mm -hmm. uh, right. a little a little guy and uh, Lou had been given this mission by Bob to get Jamie Lee to do a bunch of lines for the TV spots, you know. <laughs> so, he, and this light, this this list had been circulating for weeks, and everyone had kind of thrown a line in there, and it was like, you know, you know, this time you die, Michael, and you know, uh, you know, and it's Halloween for you, Michael, and just <laughs> all these fucking oh, hideous Christ. lines, you know, oh. and, and this, this night, you know, I, you know, and then, you know. It was just all these kind of like one-liners that you know you see in trailers in the in the in the nineties. You know what I mean? Just like you know, and they were going to put like a black screen behind her and have her do these lines right into camera, just a big close-up of of Jamie Lee. And uh, I don't think Jamie Lee wanted to do it, and it had kind of been going around and around and around. And and but Louis Spiegler had really made this his mission to get this. And I think Bob was chewing his ass. Have you got those lines? Have you got those trailers? Because it was all about trailer moments, you know, with Bob. Get trailer moments, trailer shots, trailer lines, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I remember being there the day of the, where they'd finally got this scheduled. I think it was Jamie's last day, so she had to do it. And Jamie was getting paid a million dollars. She got paid a million bucks for her role in that. And she yes, was only yeah. doing a few days. It was amazing. Um, yeah, it was a, a big chunk of change to do this, uh, to do the movie. Um, and they were excited to have her in it, you know. So, um and she was really into it. She was working hard and she was excited and she was like, you know, um, but um, I don't think she wanted to do these lines. And she'd said, I'd seen her in makeup trailer going, I'm not doing these fucking lines. Have you read them? They're awful. So the Louis Spiegler was like a dog with a you know bone in his mouth. He just had to get this done for his boss. So eventually they, you know, they, I think she'd finished her scenes and they were like, and she's like, it's over here. Right. And they're like, yeah, over here, Jamie. And then we've got a second camera set up and the camera's pointed at her and they've got like microphone rolling and they, they, and Jamie stands behind the camera and she's ready and Lou's like, he's directing it. And he's like, okay. And I give her the list of lines of like 30 lines on this fucking thing. And she stands there and this is how I remember it. Maybe I'm not remembering it completely correctly, but all I remember in my befuddled memory of that time is Jamie Lee looks into the camera and she's got this list and she's like, okay, you ready? And they go, yeah. And they go roll camera. And she's like, okay. And they go action. And she goes, fuck you, Bob. I'm not doing this shit. It's oh, stupid. you're <laughs> kidding me. And Luce Big was like, you know, like, like <laughs> is he going to go and drag? Like, you have to do it. She just said, no, I'm, I'm not doing this shit. And she just walked off. And I was like, oh my God, that was amazing. Now, um, my Gary, biggest memory of that film, what was really cool was 
that okay. they built the whole house. The whole house was yeah. built, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, you know, the whole set was that you could walk through the whole thing and go through the house and every room connected to itself. Okay. And it was wide and uh, it was really cool to be able to go and wander around the Michael Myers house, you know. Yeah. The book also claimed that the producers, and I don't know if this was the same gentleman, wanted to bring her back for the end of the movie. So that's why they didn't show a funeral scene or anything for it. Do you recall her talking about, yeah, they want me to fight Michael again or show up at the end or anything like that? No, because that would have been weeks and weeks afterwards. The only thing we ever got called was they wanted to do that button sequence with the, um, you know, the, <laughs> which, you know, you look at it and it's so 90s where, you know, Michael's on the table and, you know, and uh, and I think it was, I think it was like hot. I mean, the girl who played the, I might be wrong again. I might be wrong. But I did get the feeling that the girl who played the pathologist was like, <laughs> was a close friend of Harvey Weinstein's, you know, like it was like, oh, we've got this girl who's going to come in and be that role, you know what I mean, to play, uh -huh. to play that ah. particular person. Or somebody, or girlfriend of somebody, or so, who was, who was, who was definitely like a, an ingenue given a chance or something like that. I remember it being like, who's playing this part? Um, but it was, um, maybe I'm wrong, maybe again, speaking out of turn, but uh, it was all, you know, and I got, it, we shot it in New York and it was very close to the release of the film. And it was all about that, you know, that eyes open moment of, of course, we can't kill Michael Myers. Of course, he's got to come back and, you know, you can't kill the icon, blah, blah, blah. But, um, right. but it was an interesting shoot, that's for sure. And I mean, uh, it's funny, it was funny years later working with Katie Sackhoff again and seeing how Katie star rose and uh, Daisy McCracken working with her and seeing how right. John yeah. Patrick Thomas's career, you know, which was on the rise, then took a dive. And yeah, yeah it was a, it was interesting, yeah. you know, but I mean, um, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, well, the final question, the final Ooh. question for Gary tonight is Halloween. Halloween. Hello. Really? What you're going to you end on that? You're going to end on that? I love that. 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 I love no, 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 no. I mean the the idea that they had to to I know you know to mix these two franchises. Do you know how far along that went? Was that real? Like, was that something you guys thought was going to happen? You get one more question after this, okay. so you know, I can't end on that one. Uh, no, not at all. I think um, I think uh, the Halloween people were like, nah. <laughs> that's how well, Malik. Did, that's how Malik like, put it. He was like, nah, we no. When I did. Um, no more souls we did have a michael myers mask and a michael myers boiler suit and i did say oh while we're here we've got the set we should just have pinhead kind of walk up and do a line and then have michael myers walk into frame and stand and have them go you know like in the stare off you know and just go black and i said oh if we post that that'll light up the the internet like a, a christmas tree but we just never did it for some reason i wish we had have done it we had we had it ready to go and i should have yeah. shot it just to put the two icons together on on camera but um, no, it was one of those things that seemed to be talked about. There was, but there was never a script, and there was never a a really hard discussion. From my understanding, um, and, and rightly so, Malik and Mustafa, especially, you know, they really protected that franchise, same as they never allowed it to go to DVD. They they manifestly said, no, these are theatrical movies that will always be in the cinema, and good for them. You know, they uh, they protected their franchise and have maintained it. And look look where they're at with it now. I mean, it's insane that. All these years later on, we're looking at a film that's probably going to open again and do a hundred million dollars. Even right. though, in my opinion, Halloween 2000, 2018 is a great film. I think Halloween Kills is a pile of shit. So I mean, uh, and uh, I have no problem saying that. I think it's fucking stupid, badly written, awful crap. You know. So what uh, about? I don't, I don't care who's. Screw it. I'll make. Show me the poster. Right? Hey, screw yes, it. Yes. Yeah, screw it, Gary. I'll make this the last question. Christian, I don't care. Yeah, you get the we, last we've covered. Question. We've covered a lot of great stuff with you. You hate Halloween Kills. Yeah. The me and Nick literally get death threats because we like Rob Zombie's Halloween movies. Oh, are man. you gonna Are you gonna give us death threats too, or did you think those were okay? <clears throat> Rob just, Zombie just, just admit it. Just admit Rob that Zombie's they're damn great films. Uh, films. I just, I can't get through Rob Zombie's films. I just can't get through them. Yeah. I just find them. I find like halfway through, I'm like, I think I'm going to take a shower. You know, like, <laughs> I'm going to take a bath. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that. I, I think I, I tried to watch it again. I hadn't seen it, and I went back and watched it the other day, and just that whole opening scene of him and the family in the house, and right, just like it's just so white trash nasty that I'm like, uh. Maybe maybe it's because of my upbringing, and I didn't was raised like in a house like that. That I 
I find that more horrific than the the stuff that happens in the movies. You know what I mean? I find it more. I don't. I just don't find it a pleasant place to watch a film at. We're yeah. watching uh, husbands who are you know horrible to their girlfriends and shitty and. and Kids who are being mistreated and all that. That's our, just, That's me and Nick's taste, I guess. Well, no, 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 no. Hold on. I got to say, <laughs> I, I am not a huge fan of Rob's first Halloween, though it was my first Halloween experience in the theater. It was your first, yeah. Rob, Rob's on. Well, I had seen the original and everything, but that was my first in the theater. But I am a massive fan of his second film. That's and the I'm, one we really, really yeah, love. And it's simply because that movie is the pessimistic view on ptsd and the fallout of what happened in the first movie and it's just this gritty realism of what if we don't have these characters come out of it and be happy-go-lucky and make something great of their lives what if they come out of this and they spiral into madness and I, i i think that's beautiful because a lot of times in hollywood the the you know the itch is to go Let's make them, you know, come out of this and be stronger and be better. And Rob said, no, fuck that. What <laughs> what if they just lose their shit? And I, I really yeah. did love that. But you're right. The first half I haven't, of Rob's I haven't watched it. I haven't watched the, I don't think I've seen part two. So I'll go back and watch Gary, it. Gary, please, please yeah. watch part okay. two for me. It is okay. Okay. so much better than the first one. Okay. So, like miles better. And you, it's you shot like on Halloween 16 Kill. millimeter. It's beautiful. You like, Halloween, you like Halloween Kills? We have fun. Yeah, we have fun with it. I mean, I like look, it like Resurrection. I think they're just both silly, fun movies. It, that, I mean, is that fair, Gary? You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, no, actually, I would say, it's, see, I'm very pure about my horror. I like horror to be like, I remember being young and watching Evil Dead and loving Evil Dead. Oh, right? God. One of my was, favorite franchises. And then the first time I saw Evil Dead 2 at the cinema, I was really, really pissed off. Really pissed Too off. Too funny and just. Because yeah. I was like, you've made it into a comedy, and this wasn't a comedy. I come in and this, you know, this was genuinely scary. I mean, now I love Evil Dead too, but at the time I was really, really. What about Army of Darkness? How do you feel about Army of Darkness? See, by then I was really into it. Army of Darkness is a movie that I probably quote more than any other movie. I mean, Mm -hmm. anytime I need to leave anywhere, I'm like, let's get the hell out of here. You know, I mean, I I, I, I adore that movie, you know. So, I mean, I love Bruce and uh, the absolutely like, uh, no, uh, once, once I know that we're going down a certain path, but, you know, back in the day when you couldn't read everything and see everything about a movie in advance, all I knew was the guy who made Evil Dead, which I thought it's was genuinely back. terrifying, right. uh, was now going to do a second one. It's going to be bigger and bolder and scarier. And then suddenly it's like really goofy, campy comedy. And uh, right. yeah, it took me a while to get used to it. So I, I guess with horror, you know, I'm kind of a bit of a, like, uh, I have to, usually when I pitch backwards and go back, I can watch things and enjoy them again. So, but I remember watching Halloween, Rob Zombie's Halloween and going, God, this seems to just be a kind of like this is a nasty family. Like they're all horrible in this, and the you know the husband's horrible, and the the wife's uh you know it's like it's gritty and nasty. And I get it, he's got to come from a broken home and all that, but it just uh I don't know. I I, I kind of like the brutality of like you just presented with the character straight away in the first film, and there's mm-hmm. no explaining of it. And uh, like, sure. I find that with Rob's films is that um you know he had them, I and that's his thing. Like I thought um As for Thousand Corpses was good. I really enjoyed well, that movie, yeah. but I thought Devil's Rejects was just, I call it nasty. I go, this, this is a nasty movie. Like, it's, they're, they're a nasty bunch of people. And to spend 90 minutes with them, I find pretty hardcore. Like, I don't like the people in the movie, and uh, I don't want to hang around with them by the end of it. I'm, like, generally, like, a dis- I'm, I'm uncomfortable. And I'm mm-hmm. sure that's what Rob's going for. Uh, and I bet if you watch The Monsters, I bet you won't want to spend much time with them. <laughs> we both did. We both did this evening. It's PG. It's, it? a, it's a kid's movie. It's a kid's movie. It's actually quite funny at times, yeah, but yeah. I got to tell you, Gary, the thing that pops off about that movie is it, it oozes atmosphere. I mean, the okay. sets, it's gorgeous. It is gorgeous to look at. I, I had a fun time. I really did yeah, have buddy, a fun my time. My buddy Dan Roebuck's uh, in it, you know, and he, uh, he's, oh, he's, he's brilliant for... in it, too. He's, the he's best, brilliant yeah. in it. Yeah. yeah. But no, guy. I mean, I was I was texting. The only um, thing I said to Dan, and I said this to Dan, I pulled him to one side, and I just said, look, I said, uh, I said, I've got to be honest with you. My favorite Rob Zombie film is Lords of Salem. I think. Fuck yeah. Really? really? Yeah. I think it's a fucking really well-made film. And I think. It's oh, he'll great, like Halloween too. He'll like it's Halloween a great too, Chris. throwback to kind of those, those seventies TV movies, you know, you uh, should get. Yeah. But I have to say this. You can't keep casting your fucking wife in these movies, Rob. For she fuck's was sake, man. It's like, and I love her. I, she's she's, and I love Lords of Salem. She's good in it, 
but she's trying to play like a 25 year old you know disc jockey and it's like she's not 25 and and, yeah. and when you start sticking her in absolutely everything it it just sends the wrong message to people it's like at least read some other people and right. i get that you love your wife and you adore her and if she was acting in other movies in between then i'd have no problem with it but it's like when you you're the only person who hires this person it's like for fuck's sake it's man it's like, yeah really? it's the only you're other movie she's been in is the remake of the toolbox murders that I can think right. of. Every Small. other movie yeah. is a Rob movie. So it's like, so, yeah. I, like, I love it. I love it. And I'm sure you say to me, fuck you. She's my wife. I'll put in whatever I want to you, asshole. But I just think it's a, a oh, bit And like, she's hot. Oh, Sherry's you know. again, again. Oh, yeah. And like I say, but uh, but Lords of Salem, I thought, dude, I thought some of the imagery and that was absolutely fucking amazing. Oh, dude, my God. Really Wasn't it good? Oh, crazy. Those priest characters jerking off. You know? Oh, like, my that, God. I know. To me, that was I love of, it. Really closest thing well, to judge that i got inspiration I, from was like you know like uh to me to be able to show those images and get away with it like i think actually awesome. when i was making judgment i hope that rob zombie might see it and be like oh this is kind of cool. i'm sure he has gary i gotta tell you if you like lords of salem i truly do believe you will like halloween too because i have found a through line with that the people that <laughs> like lords of salem like halloween too because there's some really twisted imagery in halloween too it's very dark it's very it's a, it's just a great movie. Like I want you to watch it. Okay. Ignore Halloween. Just fucking ignore it. You are you don't even need to watch it because you can go on Halloween too. Going, guess what? Lori's friends died. She survived. That's all you need to know. What happened next? And this is what happened next. And it's just it's it's all it's amazing. I mean, I love well, the movie. We'll, so we'll get together in a month's time and we'll uh, we'll talk about Halloween. Oh, yeah. we'll talk about Halloween too. We'll talk about uh, Halloween we'll twenty twenty two. Yeah, yeah, cool. guys. We guys we have spent two hours with Gary. Um, I have to be up for work in the morning. Um, I, Gary, I, we're, I'm on Eastern Standard Time, so it's almost one. So oh, um, if you are open to it, we would love to have you back on. Let's do it like, you know, around Halloween, after Halloween, you know, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll do it. You know, let's, uh, we can talk about uh, Halloween too, and we'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about Halloween ends. Yes. And we'll talk about uh, Hellraiser, you know. So uh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll follow up. If you guys are with it, I'm down. Yeah. No, Hell absolutely. Yeah. Christian, uh, I mean, it's we charmed an, him. Honor, we charmed man. him. He said an hour. We went two oh, hours. We charmed him. He said, these guys don't suck. I'll keep talking. No, Hello, man. You, you, so. You've seen some of my previous podcasts, so you know that I'm not afraid. Oh, to. yeah. He went like three hours with Mr. H. Like, he was like, yeah, they, they really got into it. If I didn't have to work tomorrow, we'd keep going. But, Christian, yeah. you get the final word, man. Send us out. Uh, Gary, first of all, yeah, thank you, man. It's like we've had some guests, we've had great guests on the show, and whenever we we look at getting people, we always worry that people in the industry are going to be a certain way, and uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard to believe you're the guy that's directed these films we've seen and worked on all these films because you're just a you're a dude, you know, you're a guy. It's just really it's the best compliment I can give you, you know. I'm a dude being a dude who's a dude. You know well, Next time, don't be afraid. Again, if you want to ask the juiciest questions you possibly want, go back and look through my career. And if you want to say, is this true about this? I will give you my opinion and tell you what. As I remember, I have no problems. And, uh, you know, I, let, I let, let it lay where it lays. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't give a, you know, I don't give a monkey. Really be a straight shooter. We love that about you. What do you we have do. coming up next that people can look forward to? What are you working on? Yeah, I've actually done some cool stuff, actually. So I, I'm kind of semi-retired, but... I did a film with Patrick Lussier, who did My Bloody Valentine, and uh, and um, that remake was so good. Oh my god, I it was loved good, it. Right? It was cool. You know, I've always I, I worked with Patrick. No matter, we did a film called Trick a couple of years ago. Trick, um, yeah. But we did a film last year called Play Dead, and it, it was with. Uh, and this is going to be weird casting, and you're probably going to you're going to hear me out on this. But we, it's a it's a kind of a, it's a mortuary movie, and it's a uh, it stars Bailey Madison who's uh, in Pretty Little Liars and was the kid in Alone in the Dark. Strangers oh. Pray at Night. No yeah. kidding. Yeah, that's right. Yes, Strangers Pray at Night. And then the main character is played by Jerry O'Connell. No, it's not. Really? Yeah. And I got to tell you, uh, when I heard Jerry O'Connell, I was like, what? You know, Jerry O'Connell is fucking brilliant in this movie. I mean, like Christian Bale in American Psycho, good. That kind of good. Really creepy. Re yeah, really super photogenic and really creepy. And uh, now we did this film for Voltage, super low budget, shot in like a few, uh, like three weeks. Patrick bashed it out, did a, you know, Patrick's really <clears> great <throat> at what he does. Obviously, the editor of the screen movies, you know, so he knows his stuff. And then it, it got made, it got finished. And then all of a sudden, whispers started happening where they're going, 
this film's really good. We screened it and it's really good. Like, you know, and I haven't seen it. Um, Patrick was like, oh, I think it came out pretty well. And then Voltage were like, no, 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 no. We're keeping this. We're holding on to it. So now there, we don't know what the process is. All I know is that everyone who's seen it has just told me, yeah. It's a real you know, deal. It's the real deal. Like it's really cool and really creepy and they're really happy with it. And they're waiting to see when they're going to put it out. So that was cool. Play dead. Um, and then, um, and then uh, I got contacted by a great guy called Vincent Van Dyke, who's a brilliant makeup effects artist. Yeah. And yeah. he said, uh, would you be interested? It was really quite funny because uh, I got introduced to him through a friend of mine. And he said, do you want to come in for a meeting? And I went in for a meeting. He said, so I've got this project. He said, don't know if you'd be interested in it. And I said, well, what is this? Well, first of all, it's a horror film. And I was like, okay. And he said, and uh, there's a big creature in it, which I need you to apply and take care of. And oh, like, shit. Okay. And he's like, it all it's all nights. It's all shoots at nights. So I'm like, okay, well, I've only ever shot at night. I have no problem doing that. And uh and he said, and it's uh uh it's a foam latex suit, it's a foam latex suit, and you know, and I need you to make it up and do all that. And I was like, Yeah, that's what I've always done. Because everyone uses silicon now, but I'm you know, my first love is foam latex. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes. And he said, would you be interested in working on the painting of it? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I go into his fantastic shot with an amazing crew with this brilliant designed creature and ended up going to Winnipeg for 10 weeks to do a film called Dark Harvest, which is directed by David Slade, who directed uh, 30 Days of Night. Yeah. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah. And it's a, it's a period horror film uh, set in the 1960s. Um, the, how would I describe it? It all takes place on Halloween night. And uh, oh, man. it's a cool, a cool kind of like a <laughs> footloose horror, you know, weird creature movie uh, with a very cool creature called Sawtooth Jack. Um, and I did that. And that was a blast. A fantastic suit performer who played the character called Dustin Saitama, who's six foot nine and um, playing this Christ. really cool. Everyone who's seen the creature is like, oh, my God, designed by Aaron Sims and designed with vincent and built by a brilliant team and uh, absolute pleasure to put this thing on five hour application every night full body and uh really cool looking creature so did that and i was just the guy doing the makeup applying it and putting it all on and making sure it looked cool but uh very exciting to work on a period movie so cool to be doing a creature movie where you know it's all period car cars and guys with uh you know uh ducktail hair and you know like, like a cast of grease basically you know so very <laughs> excited about that and then, um, and then I ended up working doing days on um, some days on Picard, and uh, I've been working on a Netflix show for Vincent called The Brother's Son. And now Patrick Lucier has two projects: one called Camera, which is an amazing World War Two vampire movie kind of thing. Uh, oh, yeah, geez. very strange. And then a film called Black Box, which is a um, an interesting movie too gary um, are you excited for nick cage's dracula next year in course. redfield how Absolutely. the world is never going to be the same <laughs> yeah. after we see nick cage's dracula you know nick's nick's great i uh i loved working with nick but i have to tell you um one of my favorite things to do with uh, actors i really like is to try and get them to say lines from a movie that i like without them knowing that they're doing a line for me from a movie so like so what i would get nick to do is um you know, The Rock, the movie The Rock? Yeah, The Rock. You know, so there's a scene in The Rock when they go, are we good to go? Are we good to go? And he's like, good good to go, good to go. You know, good to go. So um, whenever the ADs would come in and say, is, is is Nick ready? I'd say, I think we're good to go. Don't you think, Nick? And he'd go, yeah, good to go, good to go. Ah. <laughs> and I, inside, I, inside, I'd always be chuckling, going, I just got Nick Case to say, uh, alone from The Rock, you know. I told him at the end of the movie and uh, he thought it was funny, but um, yeah, you know, but sweet, coolest guy to work with. Nick Cage is just, I would say, a cool motherfucker. He's just a cool motherfucker. Right. And nobody works as hard as Nick Cage on a film set. That guy turns up, knows he's, he knows his dialogue, knows everyone else's dialogue, knows the scenes. And uh, it's amazing when you do his makeup, as you apply his makeup, whatever he's wearing, he, he literally, he's, he's Nick. And then once he's in makeup, he's kind of in the zone all day long until you take the makeup off and then he kind of reappears i'm not saying he's kind of method and locked in it but he's um he's, he stays very very focused works really really hard i was i was i was really shocked a lot of people kind of uh you know were giving nick shit at the time when we did drive angry about his bankruptcy and all that and uh you know 
really just a cool cat really really cool guy and a, and a genuinely nice guy that's awesome to hear yeah. that just makes my day no nah. yeah, christian christian now, loves funny, nick funny as hell. and i would do things like i'd i'd um and i never thought i could do a, a, a chris a nick nick cage impression until after i worked with him for a while and got to know his cadence but i'd wear like marvel t-shirts you know i'd go down to walmart and get like a t-shirt with like you know marvel logo on it you know the marvel right mm -hmm. right 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 and walk in and nick would be like gary great shirt <laughs> dude that Quite movie that, that movie he did pig which was phenomenal i was watching the Amazing, special Mark. features on it and there's this the behind the scenes is him cooking with a professional chef yeah, and the chef is teaching Nick how to cook this meal, and all of a sudden Nick Cage just starts talking about his love for tortilla chips, and it's the funniest thing. He's like, "I really love tortilla chips. You know that crunch you get from them." And he's dead serious. It's every the night, funniest every thing. night when we used to, every night when we used to finish, um, because it was uh, he has a key makeup artist, and it was him, and then me doing his special makeup. But every night we would kind of have wine and cheese. You know, at the end of the day, oh my god! And Nick had a big glass called the Chalice, and uh, he, his makeup artist at the time, and she's no longer with him, but she'd been with him for a long time, Elona Herman. He would kind of pour the wine into the glasses, and then he would pour the wine into the chalice, and he'd go, Elona, who gets the chalice today? You know, and she'd be like, <laughs> and she'd be like, well, I think I think Gary did very well. Yeah, Gary, today you get the chalice. You get the chalice. Drink, <laughs> drink from the chalice, my friend. You know, and or he, I did, I did very good. Oh, I will drink from the chalice, and uh, we oh would buy wines. God. And uh, he was just uh, like I say, just a cool fucking guy. Just um, and again, mm -hmm. would always talk to people and uh, not a loop. Once he was in the zone, uh, you know, people would come and say, "Can I talk to Nick?" And I'd say, "I think he's kind of in the, he's in the mindset, so you might want to leave him until later on." But um, yeah, really cool. And then on the last day, uh, his last day of shooting, he always says Kentucky, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> kfc yeah he does because he's very strict on his diet and working out and keeps really fit but his last kind of he's but his little his little kind of like treat on the last day like, that last night he's like a big bucket of fucking kfc he's like gary come on have some, come get some chicken gary you know, and, uh, you know that's you want a leg or a thigh KFC. or a breast gary you're probably drinking you're probably drinking a 300 dollars bottle of wine but you're eating kfc and it's uh it's fucking spectacular. i love this man Oh, oh me my too. god, me too, Gary. Nicest guy. Thank you for stopping by and giving us your time, man. We really hope to hear from you soon. You've been a, no, let's a treat. We'll do a date for, uh, like I say, a month, and uh, we'll we'll do a happy Halloween. Yes, that sounds great. Absolutely, cool, excellent. You guys, very much played on. Uh, thanks to everyone for watching, and uh, I'll see you all guys soon. And we'll uh, we'll do this again, and we'll do another two hours and seven minutes. The Nick Hell Cage yeah. special. The Nick Cage special. Great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Gary. Take care, man. Like, Thank yes, you again. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Well, Nick, that was Gary Tunnicliffe. That was pretty awesome, wasn't it? Oh my God. The dude has stories for days. I'm telling you, we didn't even tap the surface. I mean, the we Nick really Cage didn't. stuff is killing me. I love it. <sighs> yeah, and he wants to come back on, and I'm totally for it. We, you know, we can talk about the new movie. We can talk about, like he said, Halloween ends. Talk about Halloween two, and we can dive more probably into the straight to DVD Hellraiser movies because mm. we didn't really touch them. So, but it's two hours, man. Fuck. He said an the, hour and he liked I, us. He liked I, us. I think the audience really liked this. I got a good feeling about it. Mm -hmm. I think we're we'll get some great feedback on this. Mm -hmm. So people listening right now, if you're still with us, that was Gary Tunnicliffe. Oh shit. We're still, I thought we weren't recording anymore. <laughs> no, we're still going. I just, I got to decompress. I want the audience to hear us decompress. Yeah, it was great. It was oh. great. Gary was a great guest. He's welcome back anytime. That was that was very, very fun. Great. <laughs> yeah. Well, Nick, it's going to be hard to top this guest, but somehow we'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, we will. And if we don't, well, fuck it. It's a pretty, pretty high bar. So. Pretty high bar. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, guys. Thank you for taking that ride with us and letting Gary just go. <clears throat> just letting that guy talk. Talking about you know, Nick Cage. Talking about Nick Cage, Johnny Gary, Depp. We Gary. got the exclusive on Johnny Depp tonight. Yes. Amber Heard is a turd. Amber turd. Gary Tonicliffe told you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. This has been another episode of the You Need a Horror Podcast. Take care. Nick's going to bed. This has been a production of the You Need a Horror Podcast. You need it, we got it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>